Well, good evening. How's everybody doing? Good to see y'all here. We are going to get right into the Word. We are going to minister healing very shortly. And uh, we just want to, as I said, we just don't like to waste time. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> time is a commodity. That Whatever you have is what you have. But whatever you always have to remember, time can either be spent, wasted, or invested. You get to decide what it is. But time is your major commodity. You can never uh, get back what you have wasted. And so we need to be busy about our Father's business. Amen? Amen. So let's get into the Word. Um, you can turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 13. There's going to be a couple of scriptures we're going to go to tonight. And I do want to mention something. We're, we're just on our way back from uh, Portland, Oregon. We were in Denver a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday night. And then we went to Portland. And our Portland meeting was a, there, it's a type of seminar we do. I do different types of seminars. We have our divine healing technician. We have our new man. We have our spiritual warfare apostolic training. Just different seminars that we teach on a regular basis. But we also do two types of seminars. One is called a Dominion Life Seminar, where we, it's a Dominion Life Seminar is a seminar I do for three days, and it's just me teaching for the three full days on whatever the Holy Spirit brings out and whatever he puts together. Then we have our Divine Invasion Seminar, which is usually me and another minister ministering together. And that's what we had up in Portland these last few days uh, last week. And during that time, it's funny because the Lord, I was really praying about what we should call it and what direction God wanted us to go. And the name of it was Living and Moving in the Miraculous. Just as you just stated, that that's what y'all have been pursuing. And so it just fits kind of right in here. And I'm not going to be able to give you three days in an hour or two, but we can definitely cover some ground. And what I like to do is I like to show you scripture and show you the principle in it. Because if you can get the principle, then you can also see how to apply that principle and you'll see it in other areas of scripture. And so, see, I, I could, we could come in, we could teach, we could minister healing, people would get healed and it would be great, but that's giving you a fish. I'd rather teach you how to fish so that when I'm gone, you can, can continue it on. Amen? Yeah. And so there's some things we want to look at now. There was a testimony I want to give you very quickly. I was in a town called Normal, Illinois. If you have to name a town normal, you know it ain't, right? It's just that simple. But um, it, was, it was in Normal, Illinois, and we were, it was the last night of a healing, well, a healing uh, training. And it was a healing service, and there was a lot of people there. They were pretty crammed in. It was a fairly small building, and there was a lady there in a wheelchair that had been in a wheelchair for seven years, she had been in an auto accident, and I didn't know all the details about it. I didn't know anything until that night, and so after we had been ministering to different people, she was there, and so I went to her and just said, what's going on with you? What's, what's the deal? How, how did this happen? And she said, I was in an auto accident, and then she said, and the next thing she said is this, and the doctors can't diagnose it. They don't know. They can't find anything wrong. All right, now, here's the principle I want you to get out of this. Number one. She said she was in an accident, right? If I was to minister to you in a way that I ask you what happened, what is the problem you're facing, what are you going through, what is your illness, whatever it is, I'm not looking for the name of it necessarily. Now, some things you name it, we'll know, and we've dealt with it, and honestly, we've dealt with every kind of sickness and disease, every part of the human body, but uh, it's not the name of it that it, that it stands out. A lot of times, for instance, when I said, what was the deal with her? She said, accident. See, that's a cue. I hear that. That sends up a flag. <clears throat> now I hone in on it. And so she said, and I said, okay, what's it done? Well, uh, have the doctors diagnosed it? Nope, they can't diagnose it. There's no reason for me to be this way. But she could not walk, hadn't walked in seven years. Flag number two. <clears throat> it's something doctors can't diagnose, right? Now, if it's physical, doctors can diagnose it because there will be evidence of it in the body. There will be some damage done. There will be something in the body that was, that was done. This accident, and she actually said that she was okay after the accident, and then about two or three days later, she couldn't walk. Flag number three. Because what that tells me then is that this is spiritual. And when I say spiritual, what I mean is it is a spirit. And so there's a difference. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a spirit, 
uh, devil, demon, whatever you want to call it. It, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's that or if it's a healing. Now, usually, healing, there is a physical damage done of something. There's some kind of reason. There's a physical thing. Usually, it can be uh, diagnosed. It can be found out. But then, if it's spiritual, a lot of times, they can't diagnose it because there's just nothing wrong, but it's still affecting them. And so, when I hear that, now, when I heard that she could walk for a bit, was in an accident... Now, the reason the accident part is important is because anytime there's a traumatic experience, then usually there will be a spirit of infirmity. Then after the traumatic experience, if there is physical damage that cannot be uh, diagnosed, in other words, if there is a physical result, but yet they can't find anything wrong, that is a spirit of infirmity, right? And so whenever she started talking, I automatically started picking up on that. And a lot of this stuff, nobody taught me this. I learned it by ministering to hundreds of thousands of people now over the last 20 years. And so you learn things. I mean, come on. If you're smart enough, you can learn something. Amen? Sometimes the Holy Spirit can give you a word of knowledge. Other times it's just a word of obvious. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's just there and that's the way it is. So uh, you can learn some things, right? Everything doesn't have to be a revelation or something along those lines. You can just learn by doing. And so whenever she said that, then I automatically knew that... This was a spirit of infirmity. Now, when you look at a spirit of infirmity, there's a couple of things to remember. Uh, for instance, if someone is, suffers any type of traumatic experience, like I said, maybe they get beat up really bad. I mean, you see people that just get, they get mugged, they get beat, whatever. I mean, it's near, near death kind of thing. Usually, there will be a traumatic experience. I mean, well, that is a traumatic experience. But usually, there will be a spirit of infirmity along with physical damage. Now, many times you can get rid of the physical damage. That's healing. You can minister healing to a person, and I know I'm talking fast. I'm covering a lot of ground, but I'm assuming they're recording so you can get it later and listen to it and go over it, all right? Uh, main thing is, is that, you, that I get it out so that you can get it. So uh, whenever you go through these traumatic experiences, the first thing that usually happens is, especially if it's sudden, now, which most traumatic experiences are sudden. Uh, you get beat uh, for... for especially, I uh, don't want to be sexist on it, but a lot of times if it's uh, any type of sexual assault, rape, anything like that, um, incest, any of that kind of stuff, there will almost always be a spirit of infirmity in that because at some point the person, literally their soul starts to detach. Now what happens is, and especially let's go back to a, to a, a car accident. A car accident is not planned. You don't see it coming generally. If you do, it's a matter of, a, you know, microseconds that you can actually see it's about to happen. At that point, great fear usually comes in, usually. That fear gets to a point where your mind wants to separate. In other words, it tries to repair, but it's so quick it can't. So at that moment of that crash, for you to survive that, usually your soul, it's almost like a clutch. Like you push in a clutch and it'll open up, and it creates a separation there. Now, when that happens... There's no such thing as a void. The only way you can discern between spirit and soul is by the word of God. All right? So there's no void between spirit and soul. Only the word of God is sharp enough to divide. So there is no separation. There's no, uh, it's almost like it's blended because it has to touch. But then it, when that happens, it, it's like a clutch. And there is a separation that takes place there for a split microsecond. That because there is no void in the spirit realm, as soon as that happens, a spirit comes in, usually attached with the spirit of fear. Spirits of fear, spirits of infirmity tend to run together because they know they can work off of each other. And so the fear will cause the open, then the spirit of infirmity comes in. When it comes in, it kind of comes in and tries to hold the door open. And it comes in and usually will come with some type of pain, again, that does not have any physical reason why it should be there then as it holds the door open, other things will start to come in gradually over time. And so other spirits of infirmity. And so you, you might start with one because of that. And then as soon as that accident, the, that, that, there's that opening, the spirit comes in and then your soul closes because it's over and you come, kind of come back to reality. When that happens, when we talk about spirit possession or somebody being possessed of a spirit, that is not what that is. Spirit possession is when a spirit has you. When you go through this type of traumatic experience, that spirit comes in, you close, you have that spirit. 
Do you see the difference? One time they have you, other times you have it. And so, now not that that thing necessarily wants to leave, but even if it wanted to, it couldn't because how it got in was opening and then it closes back up and it takes usually another type of traumatic experience for that to open again, at which time it would leave. Unless, of course, a person is there that has knowledge and authority over that spirit that can cast that thing out. That's the other way it can go, all right? Is everybody with me so far? So what happens, though, is that that spirit of infirmity will actually hold. And the reason I'm talking about this is because this is by far the number one thing that we deal with and that we see. And spirits of infirmity are very simply, it is a spirit, a pneuma, a spirit, and it is a, uh, of infirmity. And the word infirmity there is a Greek word, asthenia, and it actually means any type of weakness, feebleness, uh, anything like that. In other words, it's not a particular, like we say, uh, this person has cancer, that person has leukemia, this person has HIV. Those are specific things. This is nonspecific. And it's almost always attached to pain, or at least pain comes with it. So when you have the spirit of infirmity, usually after a day or two, you will start noticing pains. That's why many times even things like whiplash can't be diagnosed because it is usually caused by a spirit of infirmity because there is no physical damage done and therefore they can't diagnose it. And so when that happens, uh, this, you, you actually have that spirit. And now spirits of infirmity, like I said, you, they can have different uh, purposes, different responses or different results, but they're all going to be spirits of weakness. Basically, if you say spirit of infirmity, you could just say a spirit of weakness. Uh, it can be... Uh, physical. In other words, it could be a physical thing. It could be a moral frailty, a moral uh, failing, right? That could also be a spirit of infirmity causing that moral, uh, you know, declension there, if you want to call it that. So now the reason I'm saying that again is because spirits of infirmity are by far the majority, but they are also the weakest, smallest little imp, right? Uh, as I said, now get back to the story. When I was in normal Illinois, went through all of this, talked to this lady, and she said, auto accident, ding, light goes off, flag goes up, doctors can't diagnose it, there's no physical reason for it, ding, more lights go off. And I said, oh, okay, well, it's a spirit of infirmity. And she said, okay, well, what do we do? I said, well, I do this. And so I commanded the spirit of infirmity to go, and all I did was I just said it, said it very strong, said it with authority, clapped my hand very loud and said, go very loud and in Jesus' name. And I said, all right, now you're free. And she said, okay. And I said, what do you want to do? Do you want to get up? I just asked her. I said, do you want to get up? And she said, yeah. I said, all right, let's do it. Took her by the hands, raised her up, started walking with her. Now, she had been this way seven years. All the muscles in her legs, in her body had atrophied. You see, what people think about healing they picture movies. Movies are not the way it is, right? That's not the way it works. It's not the way it is. So you have to get that picture out of your head. If you want to walk in Bible truth and in Bible power, especially in the area of healing, you have to get all of the secular, even religious sometimes, ideas out of your head and go back to the Bible. Because the Bible does not say what most people think it says. And you have to reread it. You read it slow and you read every word. Remember that. You can't just skim because your mind... When you skim it, your eyes are very quick, and your eyes will see it, and you'll remember the verse, and you'll remember the way it was taught you, and usually you might have been taught wrong, in the area of healing especially. So the reason, the reason I'm saying that is because you have to go back through and read it. Now, I was, I, so I took a hold of her hands and started walking with her. As I started walking, her legs were, you know, I mean, it was really, she, she hadn't walked in seven years. It was really, she was really weak and wobbly and couldn't keep her balance. And so I knew, now listen, life, and we're going to talk about this, I, I, believe, I believe we'll get there. Out of, okay, healing doesn't fall from heaven. Healing has been given. It's already been accomplished. It's already been granted. Ephesians 1, 3, that God has already granted us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Granted, done, sent. Our job is to receive. Our job is not to try to pull it out of heaven. It's not going to come out of heaven, right? It's already been granted. He, and the Bible is very clear. He says that if he gave us Jesus in Romans 8, will he not with Jesus, in other words, if he gave us Jesus, will he not with Jesus give us everything that pertains to life and godliness? 
Amen? Now, that does not mean because we have Jesus, he will give us stuff. It says, will he not with Jesus? All right, let me put it this way. When Jesus moved in, he brought all his stuff with him. Yeah. All right, you got that? He brought that in. That's right. So now, understand, you are seated with him. So just as much as you are there, he's here. You get that? Yeah. Okay, because he's here, and he says that he dwells in us. Isn't that right? So he dwells in us. And because he dwells in us, now at the same time, we know he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But we also know we are seated with him. So we're there, and we're here. Do you get that? He and us are there. I know it's not good English, but I've never been accused of good English anyway. So, all right. So, but we're there with him, and he's here with us. Amen? So anything we're going to get from God is here. And it's going to come out of here to other people. If we're going to minister healing or receive healing. Now, ministering healing, it comes out. Why? Because he said that when he said this, he said, out of your innermost being, out of your belly, shall flow rivers, plural, not one, rivers, rivers of healing, rivers of deliverance, rivers of prosperity, rivers of relationship, all that rivers yeah. are going to come out of your belly. Yeah. Right that? He didn't say it's going to come out of heaven to you. Right. And he said, this he spoke of the spirit, which was not yet given because he had not yet been glorified. Mm -hmm. So he was talking about a future time, which is now, because now it's after the resurrection. Because he said, it is more, and this is a statement I have found, okay, I hadn't found anybody that really believes it. I was going to try to be nice and say I found a few, but I hadn't really. But it's very close. But it says, he said, Jesus said, that it is expedient for you that I go to the Father. He said, because if I don't go to the Father, I cannot send the Spirit back to you. So it's expedient that he leave. Now, I've, I've actually done this. I've asked Christians, how many, of you, how, how many of you are filled with the Holy Spirit? Hands go up. I said, okay, now. How many of you would actually rather have Jesus here physically in front of you? All the hands went up. I said, you don't believe that verse. Because Jesus said it's expedient. It is better for you. He said, it's better for you if I go away. Because if I don't go, I can't send the Holy Spirit. And so he, he went and then he sent the Spirit. So the Spirit was poured out into us. Do you get that? He was poured out and into, right? Now... For us, he says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Isn't that right? So he, he dwells in us. So if we're, and he said, this is the spirit. Now, how do people get healed? By the spirit. Isn't that right? He even said, he, Jesus even said, it's not me that does the works, but the spirit of my father in me. The spirit of my father in me. Who's the spirit of his father? The Holy Spirit. So he said, it's the spirit of the father in me. He does the works. Is that right? So the Holy Spirit does the works. Correct? Where's the Holy Spirit? In here. So, whenever it says that out of your belly will flow rivers of living water, this he spoke of the Spirit, then the Spirit is going to have to come out of us, not down from heaven. So the first mistake people make is they pray for the Spirit to fall, or the Spirit to come and heal, or Jesus to come and touch. And the Bible is very clear. Righteousness, which is by faith, does not say who will ascend into heaven, to, that is to bring him down, or who will descend into the depth, that is to bring him up. No, the word of the, uh, the uh, actually faith which is by righteousness does not talk like that but faith which is by righteousness speaks like this that the word is nigh you even in your heart and in your mouth so we don't say come we don't say touch we don't say heal he comes out of us and he comes out now he comes out of your he flows out of your innermost being now he can just flow straight out he can do that right but generally, especially in healing, he comes out usually two ways. Number one, since you are filled with him, there's not one part of your body that doesn't have him in it, right? right? And be, because why? Your spirit inhabits your body. If there's a part of your body that does not have your spirit in it, that part of the body is dead because the body without the spirit is dead. So if you had spirit ever in your body but except in your hand, your hand would wither up and die. Why? No life, no spirit. That should give you a clue where some people's problems are. If they have things wrong, it's because no life is going into that. Yeah. Right? Now, we we'll, might get a chance to talk about that. I don't know. But, so you got this life. So, the number one way that healing was released from Jesus, there's really two ways, but probably the most prominent and the way he told us to do it was by the laying on of hands. So, when you stretch forth your hand, his spirit fills your body 
because his spirit has filled your spirit, okay? And because of that, his spirit and your spirit are one spirit with the Lord. Is that correct? So you are one spirit with him. So wherever your spirit goes, his spirit goes. So if you stretch out your hand, your spirit has gone out. Guess where his spirit goes? So technically, actually, who's leading who? See, if I choose to do this, he's got to go with it. I can't stretch forth my hand and he'll go, nope, mm -mm, not going to do it. Mm -mm, No, not because he's in there. Wherever I put my spirit, his spirit goes. And when I touch somebody and I decide to release my spirit, his spirit, you understand? Then that spirit flows out into that person. Now, what people don't understand about healing a lot of times is that it is not flesh on flesh. It's spirit to spirit. So when I lay hands on somebody, spirit goes into their spirit. It does not go into their flesh. <clears throat> Just like pouring water on a plant, you don't pour water on the leaves. You pour it in the roots. And then the water goes up through the roots and through the stalk and all that and out through the branches and into the leaves. Isn't it right? It's how you get healed. We put in, I put life into you, that spirit. It's the spirit of life. It is his life. We release life into you. It comes by way of the spirit, goes into your spirit, and then comes out. It goes in first, and then is seen on the outside. It goes into your spirit, and then, now here's the thing. If you're a Christian, especially, his spirit's already in there. And I got, I'll go ahead and tell you the secret. You don't need my hands. He's in you. What I've got is in you. Now, you say, then how come when we lay hands, how come people get healed? Usually it's because you don't know how to release your spirit. So when I release spirit into your spirit, it's like anything else. I could take this water right here. And I could take this and take this. And if I start pouring, what's going to happen? It's going to overflow, isn't it? And 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 let's say this was, uh, let's just use some wild example, Coca-Cola. Well, (laughs) that means it's it's a darker color, right? That's all I'm talking about, right? So we got got the uh, darker color in this. This is clear water, right? I'm going to turn around. This is going to be the dark. This is going to be the clear. How's that? I like that better, right, as far as the illustration. So if this is dark, let's say it's all muddy, Dirty water. This is clean water. So I'm going to take this off and I start to pour it in there. What's going to happen? It's going to overflow. If I keep pouring, all of that is going to overflow. And and pretty soon, that's going to be just like this one. Why? Because this one forced that garbage out. That's what happens when I lay hands on you. The Spirit of God in my spirit goes into your spirit. And you've already got the Spirit in you. So all I'm doing is pushing, going under and pushing what's in you already in and out, and your spirit in you, the Holy Spirit in you, pushes out your sickness and disease. Because your sickness and disease is not spirit. It is flesh. So it, the spirit pushes into the flesh and pushes out of the flesh all of the sickness and disease. Amen? Have you got that? Yeah. And so really, all, the whole question is just how much life do you need? How much do we have to push into your spirit to clean you out? Does that make sense? And that's all it is. Now, If you know how to release your spirit out and let it go. Now, most people can do that. Most people know they can choose to believe. It's all by believing, right? Nothing fancy about it. It's just believing. And the moment you choose to believe, it starts. Then when you lay hands, it starts to flow. But what most people don't realize or know how to do is to release the spirit of God out of their spirit and into their own flesh. They know how to release it into other people. They don't know how to release it into themselves. But really, it's the same thing. You decide, well, according to what the Bible says, you can do it. You decide to believe him, and then you choose where you need that. If you're sick in an area, you just choose because your spirit touches all those areas of your flesh, and all it has to do is just flood out of that area into that area of flesh, and you're healed. Now, you can do that on occasion, which is better than not being able to do it, or you can do it See, there's nothing that says you can't turn the faucet on and leave it on. And when you leave it on, it's called divine health. Right? And when you leave it on, that flow is always flowing. How is that divine health? Because when the faucet's on, you you open up one of these fire hydrants, it's really hard to stick something in that fire hydrant when that water's gushing out. Why? Too much pressure. Isn't that right? So what you have to learn to do is that if you can learn to release that life out of your spirit, into your flesh, then the enemy can, if you keep that on all the time, then the enemy never has a chance to put anything on you because as soon as he tries to stick it on you, it just goes right back out. Just push it right back out. 
Amen? Now, it's the best illustration I can give you on it because that's the way it works. All right? It's just that simple. Now, the good thing about that is uh, if you leave it on all the time, things start happening around you. People around you get healed, even if you don't touch them. Why? Because virtue yeah. is coming out of you. Yeah, see, and we're, and we're going to talk about that. So we'll, we will get a chance to talk about that. So you have this uh, life that can come out of you. Now, that's the one way. Now, I will tell you, that is the weakest way to minister healing. Okay? It's also the weakest way to receive healing, which is by the laying on of hands. It's good because we do get a chance to say Jesus did this. And really, laying on of hands was only meant for unbelievers, technically. Really, laying on of hands was really never meant for believers. And God made a way for all four types of people to get healed because there's only four types of people. You say, how do you know that? Because Jesus gave the parable of the sower, and there's only four types of soil, and those are people. You got that? Yeah. So there are four types of soil, and it's not the parable of the sower. It's, it's the parable of the soil because the purpose of the parable is not about the sower. The purpose of the parable is about the soil that it goes into. Amen. So if that's in your Bible, parable of the sower, just mark out sower and put soil. Right? It's real simple. And he says that this, these different types of soil. There's four types of soil, four types of people on the earth. Number one, unsaved. Now, the way God made provision for the unsaved to get healed, Mark 16. Believers lay hands on the sick. Notice, believers are never meant to be the sick. He didn't say believers lay hands on sick believers. See, that was a method of evangelism. You lay hands on the sick, they get healed, they want to get saved. That's the way it's supposed to work. He said, these signs, for who? Signs are not for believers, but for unbelievers. Isn't that right? Now, it also says they'll speak in other tongues. Right? And that sign, even uh, Corinthians tells us, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, tells us that tongues uh, are actually for unbelievers. Think about that. But yet, the only place we ever do it is in church, where when we're around a whole bunch of believers. You know, it's like probably Coca-Cola, Pepsi, you know, they probably have been asking you to put their signs up in here. Why? Because they would figure not a, they get more uh, visibility out there on the road somewhere. Well, it's the same thing. Signs weren't meant for in church. They were meant for out there. Yeah. For the unbelievers. Amen? Amen? All right. We'll see. I'm not sure you're convinced yet, but we'll see. All right. <laughs> so first there's the unbeliever, right? So then the next three categories are all believers in this sense, all right? Uh, the next category is a brand new believer. I mean, they're so new, if you called them carnal, they wouldn't even know you were insulting them. They, just, they have no clue. They don't even know at this point, right? But that's out of uh, first, actually, uh, that would be out of James, James chapter 5. It says, if there's any sick among you, if there be any sick among you, hear that? Any sick among you, let him, that sick person, call for the elders, right, of the church, and they will come to them, and they will anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, and they will pray over him in the prayer of faith. Notice not the oil, the prayer of faith. Shall save, heal, deliver the sick. Amen? And if he's committed any sins, they'll be forgiven. Do you see that? Notice it didn't say you got to, that they have to confess their sins before they can get healed. It said they get healed first, then they can confess their sins. And even if it doesn't even say they have to confess their sins at that point. But it says that the elders will pray the prayer of faith. Now, this is because this James short book, right? Five chapters. It was written predominantly and used, I should say, maybe not written for, but used in the early church as a primer for how to live the Christian life. It's a beginner book of how to live the Christian life. Everything you need to know about how to live the Christian life is right there. It talks about how to treat people, how to watch your mouth, how to... Uh, you know, confess your faults one to another. I mean, basically everything you need to know on the basics is in the book of James. Number two on that point is it's only five chapters. Most people, when they get them saved, they try to send them to the book of John. Way too thick a book for a brand new believer, right? And it's because they think John will teach them about the love of God and all that. Well, that's what the church and fellowship and discipleship is for. But at this point, they're believers, so they need to learn how to live the life. So they're brand new. Give them a short book. James chapter five. Read through this. Study this, watch your mouth, watch what you say, don't treat people differently. Somebody comes in dressed real nice, don't treat them differently than you treat somebody come in dressed not nice. And so he just tells you how to live it. So that's the second person, a brand new Christian, baby Christian, that's the second level. Third level, carnal Christians. How do carnal Christians get healed? 
Right? So you're with me so far, right? Unsaved, laying on of hands by a believer, right? Brand new saved, doesn't know really much about it, doesn't know how to receive healing. Call for the elders. Let them do their job, which also means if you're an elder, you got to be able to pray the prayer of faith and get people healed. If you can't, you can't be an elder. Isn't that simple? So doesn't matter if you're the biggest tither. Just say it. Anyway, okay. So, but then you got the carnal believer. Well, how does a carnal believer get healed? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Corinthians, especially 1 Corinthians, he tells them, he said, you're carnal, you've been carnal, you're still carnal. And he said, uh, but, and then he, in chapter 11, he talks about the Lord's Supper. And in the Lord's Supper, he goes through it all, and he said, this was what was delivered to me, and I'm telling you, Paul writing to the Corinthians, how Jesus was betrayed and how he took the cup and he took the bread first and broke the bread. And he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And so then he, they took the bread and they ate it. Now, when was his body broken for you? At the whipping post. The whipping post, by his stripes, you were healed. So breaking the bread was representative of his body being broken for you. Carnal people, carnal means sense-oriented. So you need something physical. To, to say at this time, 6.39 p.m. on this day, I ate that bread and by his stripes I'm healed because that bread was his body broken from me and therefore now, and they have something, they have a point of contact that they can attach their faith to so they can be healed and they set that time because they're carnal, they need something physical to attach. So that's how carnal Christians can get healed. Now, nobody wants to admit to being a carnal Christian. That's why when we do... <laughs> The Lord's Supper, we don't, you know, specify. But if you go on through there in about verse 30 and 29 and 30 and 31, he says, for this cause, many of you are weak, sick, and die prematurely. Why? Because you don't discern the Lord's body. He didn't say you don't discern the Lord's blood. Why? Because everybody in the church discerns the Lord's blood. That's how you get saved, by his blood. You know that. But people don't understand about that body and that bread and they, because of that, he said, because you don't discern it, that's why you're weak, sick, and die prematurely. So if you take, if you partake of the Lord's Supper wrongly, you can remain sick, weak, and die early. So if, we're, if we got church members that are weak, sick, and dying early, it's because we're not explaining to them how to partake in the Lord's Supper and receive physical healing at that moment. Then he said, after that, he took the cup and said, this is my blood, the cup of my blood, right? He said, for the forgiveness of sins. Now, notice you eat the bread before you drink the cup. You can get healed before you can get saved. Why? Because he bore the stripes before he went to the cross. Yeah. Healing in the atonement. Real simple. This will be in the book. Right? So we're, we're talking about I'm writing a book on that right now. So <clears throat> this is, um, and that's for carnal believers. So carnal believers can get healed by partaking of the Lord's Supper. Amen? So that only leaves one group of people, spiritual believers. Spiritual believers. How does a spiritually minded believer get healed? Simple. Romans chapter 8. If that same spirit which raised up Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he will quicken your mortal body by that same spirit dwelling in you. You get that? So if you're a spiritually minded believer, you will automatically first say, you know what? Christianity is about me and you. Yeah. Amen? It's about your direct connection. So you just, Father, I just thank you. By his stripes, I'm healed. And you learn to receive it for yourself. And then you can actually release the Spirit of God out into your flesh. And you get healed. And you don't have to call anybody, go anywhere, get hands laid on you, whatever else. You don't have to do any of that. Why? Spiritually minded believers should have such a communion. Not that it's a high level of communion. You should just know that you are connected. That's all you have to know. If you know you're connected, you got it. Amen. Right? And then you can just receive directly from it. Now, so that's the four ways that God made for any person on this earth to be healed. Amen? Now, the number one way, as we said, was by the laying on of hands. That's what you see Jesus do. It's what you see the, believe, the uh, disciples do. But then the second way is with a word, with a word of command. Now, like I said, the laying on of hands is the lowest level. Why? Because you have to actually be physically present. Do you get that? If you have to be physically present... That makes it the lowest level. I can't lay hands on you if you're not physically present. Is that right? The highest level, and the reason we say it's that way, because the laying on of hands is, actually follows a law that's called the law of contact and transmission. Yeah. Right? So you contact them and you transmit to them. That's the lowest level. 
many times that's where uh, some carnal people would be at. Or this has got to happen. Now, the, the next up, as I said, would be a word of command. And that word of command is simply what makes that better is that you don't have to be in their presence. You can speak it at a distance. Uh, even, you know, we even use telephones to call and talk to people, but that's almost like in their presence. But then you can also speak and command Jesus with the Roman centurion servant. The, the, the centurion was there, but the servant wasn't. And if you'll notice, and here's, you know, I, I, don't, know where, I don't know where you are necessarily yet. I mean, I haven't talked to, I mean, I talked to you and I'm encouraged, highly encouraged by what I've already heard. But I don't know where each individual of you is at. Does that make sense? And so I want to, um, I'm just trying to cover a lot of ground at the same time. But with, with Jesus, okay, with ministering healing the way Jesus did, if you'll notice, the number one thing you've got to do is take the restraints off of God. And, and I'm not just saying let God be God. I'm saying he works according to principle, according to certain laws and things like that. He's very predictable, very predictable. He's, he's even mechanical in some ways. Uh, I mean, I, I could give you, you want examples? You need, do you need examples? I can give you some examples. You want examples? Okay. Tell you real quick. Uh, mechanical nature of God's power. Uh, Moses. Moses standing at the Red Sea. Everybody says, what's going to happen? The Egyptian army's coming. Moses turns and begins to cry to God. And God says, why are you crying to me? <laughs> now think about that. You got probably a couple of million man army chasing you. You've got a whole bunch of ex-slaves that hadn't ever fought anybody. And this army is bearing, the most powerful army in the world is bearing down on them. And you're the leader. Guess what? If there was ever a time to cry unto God, that was it. Right? But God said, why are you crying unto me? <clears throat> he said, what's that in your hand? Moses said, this is the rod that you told me to go. And same one he threw down and became a serpent and all that. And he said, that's right. And then God said, you stretch forth your hand and part the sea. He didn't say, stretch forth your hand and I'll part it. Now, we know it was God's power. But you have to remember this. If God told you to do something, listen carefully. This is a principle. If God tells you to do something, whether it's a command in the word or whether... It's even a, some type of leading, but you know it's God. Anything that gets between you and the fulfillment of that, you don't have to talk to God about. You crush it. Yeah. You speak to it. You speak to that mountain that's in your way, and you tell it to remove itself, and you speak. Why? Because you know it ain't from God. Because yeah. God's not going to tell you to do something that he doesn't want you to do, and then while you're doing it, try to put some type of obstacle in the way. So if you hear from God and then an obstacle comes up, it's of the devil. If it's a door, kick it in. If it's a mountain, you know, drive it out. I mean, tell it to remove, whatever. You have to remember that. Whatever stands between you and God or you and the fulfillment of God's uh, command is not from God. So you pay no attention to it other than getting rid of it. Amen? Not God, why would you do this? God, why is this happening? No. Mm -mm. That's what Moses did. And God said, shut up and... Stretch forth and part it. Amen? Do you get that? Yeah. Okay, you got that? So that was one. Now there's another one. <clears throat> Remember whenever they were fighting, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur, which is a man, by the way, in case you don't figure that out, Hur was a man. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, okay. <laughs> so, well, what times we live in. Anyway, um, <laughs> so <clears throat> the Israelites are fighting down in the valley. And Moses goes over and raises up his hands. And his hands are up. Israel wins. Moses starts getting tired. His hands come down. Israel starts losing. Hands up. Israel wins. Hands down. Israel loses. Aaron and her look. And, hmm. Let's see if this will work. They take his hands and hold them up. They win. Mechanical. Do you see that? That's mechanical. I mean, you would at least think that God would have said, no, nah, don't hold up his hands. He's got to do it on his own seems almost unfair that somebody else would come hold up their arms, doesn't it? I mean, you would think he would have to do it himself, but no, God said, hey, I don't care how the hands are up. As long as they're up, you're going to win. Do you see the mechanical power of God? Okay. Uh, they're bringing the ark back. It's on a cart. They start bringing it back in. It hits a rough place. Uh, the ark starts to fall off of the cart. The man reaches out and touches it to steady it. A good deed, wouldn't you think? 
But God had said, anybody touches that, they die. When he said it, it became a law. He didn't have to say, oh, you did it, you're dead, kill him. He didn't have to do that. The law, as soon as God spoke it, it became a law. Whoever touched it died. God didn't have to give a decree of death. He had already said, he'd already put in motion, just like he said, light be and light is. And guess what? God does not wake up every morning and say, son, S-U-N, let's do it again. Earth, let's go around, let's do it again. Uh, Light be one more time, let's keep going. No, he put everything in motion, said at one time it's still working. Isn't that right? The mechanical power of God. Guess how you got here tonight at the right time? The mechanical power of God. Why? Because we set our watches and everything by the earth and the rotation with the sun and all that kind of stuff. So you, you already rely on the mechanical power of God. But see, people don't like this because it puts responsibility on them. Whenever you find out that there are certain things that God has said to do and you don't have to wait for it. Smith Wigglesworth said, if it's in the Bible, it's so. It doesn't even have to be prayed about. It is simply to be believed and acted upon. He kind of knew what he was talking about. Amen? I mean, he, he had kind of the proof to back it up, right? Yeah. So, now, so whenever you can speak. Now, when you start to speak to someone and you give a command, if you'll notice how Jesus spoke again to the Roman centurion. See, you thought I forgot the Roman centurion, didn't you? No, I didn't. I just know you're used to watching TV, and it's kind of like, you know, channel surfing. We'll go back and come back. You know, you go back and forth, and we'll bring you back to the story. I'll give your mind a break for a second. So, now, but now, notice what Jesus did. When Jesus talked to the Roman centurion, what did he say? He, he, the Roman centurion comes up. It's amazing. Somebody asked this question the other day in, uh, when I was in Portland. Great question. And they said, okay, Jesus tells the Syrophoenician woman, when she comes, uh, she says, Jesus, you know, my son, or my daughter, I'm sorry, said, my daughter has a devil. She's vexed with the devil. And Jesus said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Sounds kind of mean, right? He didn't help her. But then you have to realize that Jesus was fulfilling the promise that God made to Abraham, that the gospel had to go to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. Syrophoenician people were Gentiles, not Jews. So he had to go to the Jew first so he could be rejected, so then it would come to the Gentile. So that's why he did not respond to the woman. But notice the woman, whenever he turned to the woman, he said, "Uh, it's not right to give the children's bread, children's bread, to the dogs. You hear that? What was he talking about? Healing, deliverance. Healing and deliverance is the children's bread. If you're a child of God, that's your bread. What are you supposed to pray? Give us this day. Daily healing, daily deliverance, whatever you need. Today is a day of salvation. Amen? Do you get that? So he told her, it's not right to do that. She said, yea, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. And he said, woman, you got great faith. So now what is great faith right there? You know what great faith is? Not taking no for an answer. Even when you think the answer, no, comes from God. Because Jesus was God in the flesh. Isn't that right? So even if sometimes if you think God said no, you say, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Uh, You said all the promises in him are yes, and so be it. So you can't say no, because God said, I will never change any word that's gone out of my mouth. So if you hear a no to a promise, it is the devil talking, imitating God, do not take no for, a, for an answer and push through and decide to push through no matter what. Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. All right? I hope you're taking notes. Right? These, each one, listen, each one of these nuggets can get you healed, get your loved ones healed, can get them saved. I mean, it can change your life. One nugget is all it takes yeah. to get you completely healed and saved. Amen? Amen. And so then, now, then the other case, there's only two people Jesus ever said had great faith. One was this woman that we just talked about. The other was a Roman centurion. Now, notice this. The Roman centurion, and that's what the question was from Portland, why did Jesus help that, the, the, refuse to help the lady at first, but yet whenever the Roman centurion came up and said, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, Jesus doesn't even wait for an invitation. He literally jumps at the chance and says, I'll come heal him. You notice the man wouldn't finish talking. If you read the story, he wouldn't finish talking. Jesus interrupted him and said, I'll come heal him. And then the Roman centurion said, whoa, whoa, no, no, you don't have to come. I didn't come to get you to come to my house. He said, I'm a man under authority. And I tell my servant to do this, he does it. I tell him this guy to do that, and he does that. If you just speak the word only, I know my servant will be 
healed. In other words, Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. I recognize you have authority, and if you speak, my servant will be healed. Do you get that? And Jesus, it says, if you read it, it says he turned to his disciples, his own followers, and told them, I have not found such great faith, no, not in Israel. In other words, he, he wouldn't talk about the nation of Israel. He was talking about the people of Israel. He said, I hadn't found this kind of faith in you guys. I mean, here's this, uh, you know, Jairus, he comes and says, you've got to come. My daughter's dying. You've got to come. If you lay your hands on her, she will live. But here, this Roman centurion, not a covenant person, has no covenant rights. And yet he comes and says, you don't have to come to my house. All you've got to do is give a command. And he had greater faith than a covenant person, Jairus, who said, you got to come. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Jesus said, you've got great faith. So what is great faith with a Roman centurion? What was his great faith? Now, put it this way. If you want to walk in great faith, it's easy. Learn authority. Uh, knowing authority is great faith. When you learn authority, you will operate in great faith. If you do not learn authority, you will not operate in great faith. It's just that simple. And now, we'll, and we'll go into this. We'll, we'll get a chance to go in here and to, to it in just a minute. Now, notice, so when he told him, notice what Jesus said. It was really amazing. After he said, I have not found this kind of faith in you guys, you know, to the Israelites, he said, when he turned back to the Roman centurion, he said, Go your way, as you have believed. Actually, he said, according to your faith, be it done. In other words, what you've already said. Notice he didn't say, servant, be healed. He never prayed. Do you get that? I'm trying to get you to stretch. Don't think it's a formula prayer. Don't think it's a certain way of praying. Even though it can be mechanical at times, it's not a formula in that sense. In other words, remember when Jesus, at one point, uh, he was healing the... Um, palsy, well I actually did a couple of times, but there was a man with palsy lying on a pallet and he goes to the man and he tells him to stand forth at one point and so, oh actually before that that was a guy with a withered arm, but he said, he, was, he told him to stand forth and the Pharisees, uh, they were getting ready to jump on him, right? Why? Because he's fixing to heal this guy on the Sabbath. Wrong day to heal, right? And so he's fixing to heal this guy, and they're all waiting, and he turns around to him, knowing their thoughts, and says, which is easier to say? Your sins be forgiven, or rise and be, you know, rise and be healed? Which is easier? You think, well, he should say healed because he was sick. No, but he had told him, your sins are forgiven. He said, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. Amen? Do you see that? Yeah. So what does it matter? Does it matter which statement? Okay, let me put it this way. Um, Let's say you go, I'm trying to figure, there's somebody in jail and you're a lawyer and you go in there or you're somebody, you know, somebody, I don't, it doesn't matter who at this point, but you go visit this person in jail, but you have the authority to get that person out. So you go in there and you talk to this person. Now you got a guy with you there that has the keys. You're talking to this person and you decide not to whatever, press charges or whatever it is. And you say, now, does it matter if you say, all right, get him out of here? Or is it okay to say, uh, let him go? Uh, is it okay to say, all right, set him free? All three different statements, right? But the same intent. Do, do you get it? Does it matter which one you say? No, because it's the intent of what you're saying. When Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, arise and be healed, it was the, tent, the, the intent was, you are free. Do you get that? And that's what he came to do in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. He said, this is what I was sent to do. This is what I'm anointed to do. Set the captives free. Open the eyes of the blind. Heal the brokenhearted. Isn't that right? Yeah. That's why you never, okay, you never see Jesus, anything in the scriptures, one time. I'm going to put it this way. One time. It says that the, he was led of the spirit into the wilderness. Is that right? Yes. And another gospel says he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. Is that right? Yes. Okay, now, you will never find another place that says Jesus was led by the Spirit. Why? Was he led by the Spirit? Of course, all the time. Why? Because that's who he was. But it never says he was led by the Spirit. So it wasn't an individual act. He was led by the Spirit whenever he did Luke 4.18. He went about doing good, healing all the repressed of the devil. Do you get it? He just went about. If you want to get healed, just get in his way. Just get in his path. Amen? 
That's all you had to do. I mean, it's pretty easy, isn't it? Why? Because he was sent to heal the brokenhearted. Well, isn't that what he did? Remember the, the woman caught in adultery? I'd say she's probably brokenhearted. And he said, yeah, your sin's forgiven. Isn't that right? Who condemns you? He didn't, he didn't do that. Uh, whenever Mary came and wiped his feet and all that, and he said, no, you know, your sins and all this, and, but they're forgiven, and your faith has saved you. I mean, think about that. What was he doing? He was healing her broken heart, right? But he also opened the eyes of the blind. You know why? Remember what he said in, Luke, in uh, John chapter 9 about opening the eyes of the blind? He said, as long as I'm in this world, why this day I got to work? He said, night's coming, I can't work. But he said, but as long as I'm here, I'm the light of the world. And he opened the eyes of the blind. So if, if you're the light of the world, you should open the eyes of the blind. Don't you agree? Yes. But you know what Jesus said? You're the light of the world. Yes. Isn't that right? He said you were the light of the world. Yeah. So if you're the light of the world, you ought to be opening blind eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen? As he is, so are we in this world. As he is. Amen? Amen. Do, do you get this? Yes. And so now, after that, notice here, though, uh, Jesus told him, When he turned around, he said, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the man that was paralyzed, rise, take up your bed, go home. Notice what he said, so that you may know that the Son of Man hath, now notice he said Son of Man, he didn't say Son of God. When he said Son of God, he was talking about his divinity. When he said the Son of Man, he was talking about his humanity and God living in humanity. And so he said here that you may know that the Son of Man, a person in whom the God, in whom the Spirit of God was dwelling, has authority to do this. Do you get that? Jesus understood authority. And so if you're going to walk in faith, and especially great faith, you're going to have to learn authority. That is the bottom key. That's why so many people, policemen, military, man, they, they grab the gospel that quick once they, once they see the authority part. Why? Because they understand authority. They know what it means to get a command and do it until you get another command. You don't need a command every day. Yeah. Amen? You just keep doing the same command until you get another command. And so they know that and they understand that. I mean, imagine, I, know, I don't know about you, but I know me, I, I would not want your typical spirit-filled Christian cop patrolling my neighborhood. Wouldn't want it. Not, not, I'm talking about typical. Why? Typically trained. Why? Because for all we know, they could be come by, somebody could be climbing out my window with a television or something. And if he's typically trained, then he's going to, first thing he's going to say is, well, you know, uh, headquarters, uh, should I arrest this guy? Is a guy coming out of Curry Blake's window. Should I arrest him? I, I mean, I got to call headquarters to find out if I should act because I, you know, I'm taught I should only do what I'm led to do. And so, now, should I, should I arrest this guy or, or what should I do? Uh, because, you know, I'm not sure what the situation is here because maybe Curry's just reaping something he sowed. <laughs> just saying, I don't know if I were to get involved in this or not. Um, but, you know, I mean, come on. I mean, I mean maybe Curry's great granddad was a thief. <laughs> and so that generational curse thing has come right on down to Curry and now he's reaping it. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, Come on, I just, I don't want to do anything wrong. So headquarters, what should I do? And what they're going to tell him is very simple. Arrest the guy, come in, turn in your badge and your gun because you're too stupid to be a cop. (laughs) Why? You were hired to enforce the laws of the municipality that hired you. Well, guess what? Okay, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. I'm going to anyway. Might as well say yes. Okay. So there was a man that owned a vineyard, owned a, a, a field, put it that way. And he went out early in the morning, and when he went through the middle of town, all these people standing around talking, right? And so he said, what are you doing standing here talking? And they said, well, nobody's hired us. And he said, well, I'll hire you. Go to work. And at the end of the day, I'll pay you this much money. And, you know, it's probably $100, something like that, whatever it was. I said, I'll pay you that much money. Okay. And so they all went to work. Then he went back to his home, went back to his office, comes out a few hours later. There's a whole bunch of new people standing there. He said, what are you doing standing around? No man has hired us. Well, I got a harvest field. Go, go work. At the end of the day, I'll pay you. And he agreed to pay them the same amount he was paying the other guys, the first guys. So he goes back in and he does this a couple more times. And then finally, and every time he goes out, now notice the key about this scripture is amazing, or this story is amazing because the thing that stands out is this. Everybody got hired. He never walked past anybody and said, nope, just 
stay doing nothing. I'll be back by later. No, he said, get busy. Don't stand here wasting the day. Get busy. Go out and work. And at the end of the day, I'll pay you. And then we know the story. They all came in. And the ones that got there early in the morning were there with the ones at the end of the day. And they all got the same amount. And the people that got there early got mad because they didn't get more money. You know, they, they were getting the same amount that the people at the end went. And they all got upset. And he said, well, why are you getting upset? I told you what I'm going to pay you. That's what I paid you. What I paid these other people is none of your business. What does that mean? Don't look at how God's using other people and not doing these things and, you know, all this stuff. No, you do what you're supposed to do. You know, clean up your own backyard. Figure out your own stuff. Amen? And don't worry about this other stuff and other people. Don't compare yourself with other people. Amen? If you're going to compare yourself, there's only one to compare yourself to, Jesus. Okay? You've already fallen short. Right? But you can always pick it up. Amen? Why? Because it's him working in you. Do you get that? So, now, understand this. Already this guy, now, and the the people got all the, uh, he hired everybody that came in. So, the bottom line with that is this. Nobody doesn't get to work. I know this is bad English, but again, it gets the point across. Amen? Now, I want to show you, also, I want to take you to a couple more places. Have you found Luke 13? Okay. (laughs) Hopefully you have. But are you, are you getting anything out of this so far? Yes. Amen? Because I can come at this a thousand different ways and it all ends up at the same place. It's amazing. I've taken every argument. I've, I've got a, a, a good library, okay? I have bought a bunch of books that I wouldn't buy again uh, because I, I wanted to go through them and find out all the arguments against healing and all that stuff. And I went in and found all the arguments and everything everybody said. And then I went to the Bible and found out what the Bible says and found out and answered all those arguments because I had some of the same questions because I was raised the same way and taught the same stuff. And so here's what I've come down to, though. Here's what I found out. If you really want to function in healing, it's easy. Take everything you've learned in church and do the opposite. <laughs> that, that's the short court curse. Now, and now understand, I, I mean, I, and I know that's not true for you here because I heard that you watch y'all been moving toward and all that kind of stuff, and so that's good. But I'm saying, generally speaking, I have found that to be the case uh, in many, many times, which is sad. Uh, so Luke chapter... 13. We'll go to Luke 13. Let me get over there. There we go. And we'll start in verse 10. It says, And he was teaching <clears throat> in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Now, I'm just going to take this apart for you a little bit as we go through it. And I want to show you the principles and the things that are here. It says, uh, verse 11, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. Remember, we were talking about that earlier, spirit of infirmity. 18 years. Isn't that amazing? Now, remember, and I still haven't forgot the woman that I was talking about. Remember the woman? Yeah. And there you go. Okay, well, I'll tell you her story in just a minute. Finish it anyway. And we're just channel surfing, right? Yeah. Okay, so it says that she had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. Now, do you understand bowed together? That means that she was so far over that she was down. Now, understand, she was so far down, she couldn't even see what was, she could only see her feet. She couldn't see what was ahead of her. She had to walk that way and try to look and see and walk, but she was bowed over that far. Now, I'll give you a definition here. Based on her symptoms, if she were here today and there was a doctor present examining her, he would say, these are the options. Osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, scoliosis. Okay, now, now listen to this. Bent over is the most common change in posture with Parkinson's disease, right? So if somebody saw that, that, that's one of the first ones they would say. They would say, this is probably Parkinson's uh, or some stage of it, right? Or osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, scoliosis. This is, your, this is what they would start weeding through if they were a doctor, which they would be wrong because it was a spirit of infirmity. Do you see it? And now they couldn't diagnose it because they, can't, they don't have machines to, to spot or see spirits. You got that, okay? Now, notice, here's what they say about it. And this is one of the clues. It is not known why this occurs. Now, that's from a, a medical book. You get that? They don't know why this happens. And see, when I read that, I'm like, oh, it's because it's a spirit of infirmity. They don't know why it happens. Amen? Do you see how all these things line up? Okay, now watch. All right. So this woman is bowed over. Now let's just read through and just, as they say, unpack it as we go. 
She was bowed over and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, I notice he saw her. He didn't hear anything. He didn't hear the father's voice. None of that's there. If you say that, you're adding to the Bible. Do you understand? That is spe- anything other than what's written is speculation. Do you get that? Yes. So we don't want to speculate when we have scripture, right? So, and when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, how much faith do you have? That's not what he said? Hmm, okay. Woman, do you feel lucky today? <laughs> is, that not, uh, is that not what he said? Hmm, okay. Woman, uh, how, much, how anointed do you think I am? Oh, now see, that could be a question, couldn't it? But it's not there, is it? You notice how much stuff sometimes we put stuff in. Okay. Woman, hast thou been faithful at tithing and offerings? Hmm, not there, is it? Okay. Now, and I, I'm, I'm one who tithes and offers, you understand? So I'm not against that. I'm just saying we can't make that part of healing. You understand? We got to separate the truth. Amen? Now watch. He says, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. He didn't even ask her what was wrong. Do you get that? He didn't ask her any, Did he ask her anything? He didn't even ask a question. Let me put it this way. Did he say, and he said unto her, woman, do you want to be free? Did he say that? Did he say, woman, can I pray for you? He didn't say anything like that, did he? He just said, woman, you're loosed. That's a command or a statement. Is that right? Are you getting stretched a little bit? I mean, are you seeing? Okay. Okay. If you ask somebody if they want you to pray for them, you give them the opportunity to say no. So don't ask. (laughs) Isn't that simple? You just do it, right? I mean, you've got to get their attention somehow, right? Whatever it is. Me, I just usually walk to the people and stick out my hand to shake their hands, you know, up until recently. When you do that and everybody runs from you, you know. <laughs> and tell me this isn't an attack against the gospel. Come on. <clears throat> when they want you to not talk, not touch, you know, not lay hands and not do it. Everything they're saying goes against scripture. So you have to decide what you're going to obey. Real simple. All right, anyway. So, he says here, now, but now notice this. He did not say anything to her other than, well, what I, I guess I should finish. I stick my, I don't just stick my hand out at people. I stick my hand out and I say, hi, my name is, and I give my name, and then usually they'll take your hand and you start shaking it, right? And when you start shaking their hand, to see the key is don't stop. Just keep going. Why? Because as long as you're shaking it, they'll shake hands with you. If you stop and hold it, usually they'll pull back. So you just start and you talk to them. And usually I'll say something like, hi, my name is Craig Blake and I pray for people and God heals them. I'm going to pray for you right now in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Amen? Amen. And when you do that, now notice, when you do that, now if they're really opposed to it, a lot of times they'll start pulling away. If they do, let them go. You know, don't, don't hang on to them. You get, you know, get into a wrestling match with them. Amen. But you start, you, you do that. Now the thing is, Notice, even if they go, no, too late, I've laid hands. Too late, sorry about that. But, see? And then people say, well, but, but if, if they don't want to be healed, uh, okay, tell me, okay, hold your place there in Luke 13, and go with me to Mark. Mark 16. Ready? Okay, I'm going to read this to you and ask you some questions. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Do you hear that? Okay, now, show me in there where it says pray. The word pray is not in there. 
Do you get that? Asking to pray. Does it say, and, okay, where it says there, he that, uh, yeah, yeah, he that believeth on me, uh, they shall, yeah, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why? Because the believer is laying hands. Has nothing to do with the unbeliever. Why would you expect an unbeliever to believe? If they believe, they'd be a believer, not an unbeliever. There, I do know that some unbelieving believers, I'll, I'll admit, but that's not the biblical standard. Amen? Do you get this? So you don't have to ask, okay? He says they'll cast out devils. Is there anywhere? Well, but you can't cast out a devil if somebody wants to keep it. Where does it say that? No. So you have to realize Mark 16, okay, for me, Mark 16 is an agreement between me and Jesus. It has nothing to do with the sick person. It has to do with an agreement. He said, this is what I will do. And so I'm going to do this. He said, I, and if you read through, he says he gave his disciples, not just his apostles, his disciples. Now, the later, the, later they became apostles. At first, they were just disciples. We're disciples. Amen? And he gave his disciples authority over all sicknesses, over all manner of disease, and over all devils to cast them out. There you go, all of them. Not just the ones people don't want anymore. Amen? Amen. All right, I'll tell you, if a person has a devil, they wanted it. Not technically. I mean, a lot of them wouldn't say, I want a devil, but they want what they did that brought the devil with it. So most of that's self-inflicted anyway. So to ask somebody, do you want this? I mean, okay, let's say, you know, can I pray for you? Do you want to be free? No, I don't want to be free. How do you know you're talking to the person and not talking to a lying devil? How do you know that devil isn't speaking to them and saying, no, I don't want to be free? So you don't know. So you just have to cast the thing out. Some people you say, do you want to be free? No, I don't want to be free. You know why? Because they've never been free and they don't know what freedom is like. And then you have people that are high and alcoholic and that kind of stuff. And they're like, no, man, I am free. I'm doing everything I want to do. Really? Okay, then let's see. Let's see you quit. You say you, you don't have to have it. You don't have to do it. You're not being compulsed to do it. Let's just say, I'll make you a bet. I'll make you a bet of X amount of dollars. You can't stop for a week. And then they try it and they can't. Guess why? Because you got a devil. And that devil drives you. That's what they do. And so it, you're no longer free. You're not doing what you want to do. You started doing what you wanted to do. And then the devil got a hold of you. And now you're doing it because you got to do it. Do you understand that? You're awful quiet. Just, okay. <clears throat> okay. Now watch. So, but there's nothing in there that says pray or ask. Isn't that right? Okay, let me ask you this. If you believe you have to pray before you can exercise the power of God, if you believe you have to get the person's permission, you will never raise the dead. Right. <laughs> Isn't that simple? Because you can scream at that body all day long. Can I fix you? <laughs> they ain't going to answer you. And let me tell you, if you can raise the dead, you can do everything lesser. Amen? Amen? You think God's going to give you power to raise the dead and not heal a cold? Of course not. See, we just don't think these things through. That's been the problem. Many times we've thought religiously and we've passed down things that were passed to us rather than actually reading it and seeing what it says. And, and honestly, most of the time we just don't give God the benefit of the doubt. You know, we think he's up there holding on to all his power. And, you know, well, I'll give you a little bit, but don't use too much. You know, and that's the way we think about things, but that's not God. God, God, he says, and the thing is, he tells us. Then he tells, he said, listen, as you go, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you've received, freely give. What does that mean? Freely heal the sick, freely cast out devils. Amen? What does that mean? That means give it to anybody that needs it. He even said that at one point. He said, give to any man that asks you. Somebody walks up and says, and I actually had a man do this one time. I, was, I went into Oklahoma across the Texas border into a, a man's house, a person I knew. I knew his son, stepson, and he said, would you come pray for my dad? And I said, yeah, we'll go. So we go up there, and on the way, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. I just got in off of a trip. I was tired. I did not want to go. didn't care for this guy. Uh, I knew about him. You know, I knew some stuff about him, and I just didn't want to go there. But he had some severe back pain. It had several surgeries. Nothing had ever helped. It actually got worse. And so this young man asked me to go 
you know, pray for his dad, stepdad. And I said, okay, I'll go. Why? Because he said, I, I've told God I would never turn down an opportunity to pray. Or if anybody asked me, I would, say, I would never say no. And so that's what we did. So we're driving up there. And I told him, I said, you take your car, I'll take my car. Why? Because I wasn't going to stay. I wanted to pray and go. I wanted to get out of there. Didn't want to sit around and hang around and wait for somebody to, you know, chauffeur me back and forth. And so I said, you drive your car, I'll drive mine. And while I was driving up there, I'm not excited about it. I'm not happy about it. And I'm telling God about it. And I told him, I said, you know, I'm only doing this because I made a promise to you. That's the only reason. I said, I I wouldn't go if I had made that promise. And then right then, God says, when you get there, ask him for a glass of water. And I'm like, I don't even like water. <laughs> I, if I would ask him, I would ask him for a Coke, right? And, but I knew he might not have one. So I said, okay, I'll ask for a glass of water. And I didn't even really realize why at the time. And so then we got up there, and I saw this guy, and he could hardly move. And it was really pretty, pretty pathetic. He couldn't move. He hurt pain. And he was sitting down at one point. And so when he come in, he was sitting there, and I sit down across from him, and I said, would you... Uh, can I get a glass of water? And he said, yeah, yeah. And he called his wife. He said, would you get it? I said, no, no, no. I said, would you get it? And he said, okay. And he started getting up. And I didn't want to do that because he was in pain. And it was like I was being mean. And so he takes him, you know, almost a minute and a half just to stand up. And he's moving really, really slow. And he's going, and he goes around and gets a glass of water. And he brings it to me. And I said, thank you. And I set it down. God said, ask for it. He didn't say, drink it. And so I set it down, and I didn't drink it. And it's, it's in Oklahoma. If you ever tasted Oklahoma water, you don't want to drink it. Anyway, anyway so some places, I'm sure Norman's okay. But <laughs> she says, no, it ain't. No, it's not. <laughs> okay. But so then I told him, I said, well, the Bible says if you give a prophet a glass of water and a prophet the name of a prophet, then you get a prophet's reward. I said, I'm not claiming to be a prophet. I'm just saying that's the... Uh, economy of God. That's the way it works. And I said, so whatever you ask me for now, I've, I asked you for something, you gave it to me. Whatever you ask me for, I'll give it to you. Yes, and and because the Bible says, whatever, if a man asks you, whatever he asks you, give it to him. And I said, so what do you want? And he goes, well, and I'm like, what do you want? And then he's like, oh, and you could see it was, his brain was turning there. And he said, and it's so funny because he wanted to do it perfect. He wanted to get the wording right and everything. He's, uh, Mr. Blake, would, would you go to God and get my healing? And I'm like, request granted. I said, now stand up. And he stood up. I put my hand on his back, commanded his back to be healed, commanded to be functioning correctly, commanded all pain to go. And I said, now, touch your toes. And this man, he, I mean, you could tell just moving was hurting. And he started to go down. And as he gets down, he starts smiling, and he smiles bigger. And now he's touching his toes. He comes back up, and he goes, wow, how did you do that? And I told him, I said, authority in the name of Jesus. I said, by his stripes you were healed, and I have the authority to set you free. And he said, glory, glory to God. And this wasn't a guy that normally said glory to God. Okay? <laughs> when he used the name of Jesus, it wasn't usually in a glorifying manner, all right? And, and then as soon as he, I said, so, so you're good? He said, yeah, this is wonderful. I said, great, bye. <laughs> um, and I, I, just, I just left. Now, but now, notice, it was authority. Yeah. You understand you have the authority yeah. over all sickness, over all disease. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how they got it. If you have to find out how they got it, how long they've had it, and what the name of the thing is and all that kind of stuff, it's because you don't have the power to fix it. And you're trying to help them get help. So you're trying to help them out. He didn't tell us to help them out. See, when you have the power to fix it, you don't care how they got it. You don't care what, how long they've had it. You don't care how it came. It doesn't matter. Why? Because it doesn't matter if you know you can fix it. Yeah. Amen? See, that's why when you know you can fix it, you never get in a hurry. You never get upset. You never get, you know, oh, I hope this works. I hope the anointing kicks in at some point. I hope something happens. No, no, none of that. You're calm, you're peaceful, no stress. Why? Because God never sends you anywhere late. He said, well, but, but what I, I did this. See, all this stuff I'm telling you, I learned this. Nobody taught it to me, most of it. Uh, there were pit, bits and pieces I picked up, but nobody really taught it to me. But I, I realized one day I got a call because my phone is on 
And it's funny because my wife, she said um, one time, she said, you know, when we married, I, she said, being married to you is like being married to a doctor. You're always on call. And she said, you know, except for the pay. Um, and so, that was, <laughs> you know, so but, <laughs> but, but God takes care of us and he, he's blessed us. So, but because of that, that phone. And so I got a call one night and it was an emergency and it was at a, I had to go to the hospital, which was not too far away. But I, I'm like, okay, get up. And, and the thing is, listen, you have to live ready. You can't get ready. You know, uh, you, you go to Walmart, you're walking through there with your little cart, you know, and, and they're, they're not playing the Benny Hinn worship CD <laughs> to set the atmosphere for miracles. Right. Amen. Now, now, listen, I will tell you, listen, I probably listen to worship music probably more than any of you because I'm on the road all the time. And when I'm on the road, I'm always listening to worship music. I'm worshiping God. Sometimes it's harder than other times because crying and trying to drive and see, to, you know, and, all that, but I'm telling you, I, I love worship music. I'm, I'm, some people think I'm against worship, but it's not that. And maybe I'll get a chance to explain. But what you, when you go to Walmart and you're pushing through there, and you're, you know, they got whatever they're going on over the speaker, and it's anything but conducive to miracles or healing. Mm-hmm. And then you, you're going through there, and somebody drops dead. You can't tell them, oh, well, okay, well here, put them in the freezer. I'll be back in three days. Because i got to go fast and pray. <laughs> now, nah, it ain't going to work. you got to live ready. Right. you got to be ready. Yeah. Instant. In season and out. Amen? Amen. You've got to be ready to do whatever is there. Now, what that means is this. It me- and I'm not talking about you being prayed up, and, you know, all that kind of stuff, which you should be prayed up, I guess. But I'm not talking about a certain level of stuff. I'm talking about you being ready means that you are always quick to rely on God's power that it's available. Because I'm telling you, the devil doesn't know always what's going on around you, but he can tell. And if you start to walk in power and you're getting results, he will try to make sure you fight with people. He'll try to start fights, husband and wife, uh, neighbors, whatever. He'll try to get you in something to get your emotions all riled up and because you'll think now you're out of peace. And then right then is when you get that phone call. And you're like, I can't pray in faith. I mean, I was just, you know, ready to kick the cat, you know. I, I mean, I'm, you know, and you got all this stuff, you know. And, you know, you walk out and you just have an argument with your wife. And you're, bless God, I'll tell you what we're going to do. And shut the door. And, you, you know, you go get in your car and bless God. And then the phone rings. And when you answer the phone, and say hello. And somebody's screaming because their baby just died. And then you're, you're, you're like, Lord, that, how do I pray the prayer of faith like that? But here's what you have to realize. Two things. Number one, your emotions have nothing to do with your spirit. Do you understand? Your emotions are out of your soul. Soul doesn't heal. Spirit heals. Faith, authority, power is out of the spirit. I will tell you the truth. Okay. Hello, my name is Curry Blake, and yes, I've argued with my wife. Okay. And some of the best healings I've ever seen happen right after you know why? Because I was ready to fight. Amen. I mean, I was so mad. I was mad at her, you know, and yet I'm walking out and somebody calls and this is going on. Oh, yeah, put them on the line, right? <laughs> put them on. Put them on right now. Put them on. Let's go. Mm-hmm. I'm ready to go. I, you know, Bible says, you know, to stir up the gift that's in you. I was stirring up. <laughs> Amen. And I'm ready to go. And I'm like, oh, let me tell you something, devil. You know, I will tell you what, devil. Here's what you're going to say. You know, it's all the stuff I want to say to my wife, but I wouldn't, you know. You say that to your wife, you get in trouble. Sir Connor Devil, it's, it's a bad thing, all right? But, and then you start going after this thing, and I mean, you're doing that, and you're going after it, and you get angry on that thing because it's a fight. Now, it's a fight of faith, but it's still, you got to dig in your heels and go, you know what? I ain't backing down. You're backing down. Why? Because this is my inheritance. This is who I am. This is what God said I can do, and I'm going to do it. And devil, you're going to do what he said you're going to do, because I'm going to resist you, and you're going to flee. That's the way this works. I'm going to do my part. You're going to do your part. My part is to believe. Your part is to flee. Bye. And when you get that, he starts to do it. Amen? Amen? So, now, now, I'll tell you, before I get back in the story, the woman in the I point like she was sitting there. That's where she was on the platform thing. So I get her up. Remember the seven years? Remember? Yes. Go back to it? Okay. 
We'll pick up, you know, it was a to be continued story. So we'll pick back, I'll recap. Last week, <laughs> so, but I had this woman up. Now, life comes out of you. It can come out your hands. It can come out your mouth. It can come out your eyes. Peter, looking upon him, staring at the man, focused on the man, said, look on us. Look right here. Focus right here. And he said, silver and gold have I number, such as I have, such as what I got. I got something. I give it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, another rise up and walk. Then he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and he was healed as he was lifted. You get it? Now, then in Acts chapter 3, verse 16, when they all come running around, he said, why do you look on us? As though by our own power or holiness, we had made this man healed, uh, strong. Do, do you get that? Yeah. He said it wasn't our own holiness. It wasn't an, a special anointing, our own power. He said it was the name of Jesus and faith in that name that made this man walk. Is that right? Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. How do you get saved? Don't, isn't it by having faith in the name of Jesus? So how many of you are saved? So you got faith in the name of Jesus? Yes. So whatever Peter had that made the lame man walk, you just said you got it. Yeah. Isn't that pretty simple? Yeah. But at some point, you got to actually believe what you say you got. Yeah. That's the key. You actually have to believe what you say you have and start acting like it's true. Right? And so now... I know that life comes out, and we're going to see this in just a minute. Life comes out. Now, it can come out your hand, come out your mouth, come out your eyes. It, it can, now, and we know it can come even off of the clothing. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 12, it said that they took handkerchiefs and aprons off of Paul's body and sent them out. And if people were sick, they got healed. And if they had devils, devils left when the cloth got to them. You get that? You put, a, you put the cloth on them, it didn't even matter what they had. Whatever it was, the life that was in that, that was coming out of Paul, because when you wear it, if it's in you, it comes out of you, and it has to pass through your clothing, which makes your clothing now like a battery, that the life of God is actually stored up in it. I could give you so many testimonies. People where we have sent prayer cloths to people, as they call them prayer cloths, the Bible didn't call them that, it's just what we say, but we send these cloths out, and then one time I was on a trip, and we got a call from Florida, and this, my wife was actually um, working in the office at that time. And so we got a call from Florida, and this woman said her father uh, had had a stroke and was arm up, I think a stroke, but his arm was withered on one side, and he couldn't do anything with his arm. And they, this lady wanted a prayer cloth. And so my wife calls me and says, I can't find the prayer cloths. Where are the prayer cloths? We'll get them, we'll cut them up, I'll lay my hands on them, we pray over them, and then we leave them, and then when people ask for them, we give them out to them. And so, and notice, it doesn't lose, you don't lose the power by them sitting there. No expiration date. Amen? So, something to think about. And so, uh, but my wife said, I can't find the prayer clause. I said, well, look here, look. No, I've already looked. I said, I, I don't know what to tell you then. You know, I'll, I'll be back in a couple of days. Well, she figured out what to do. She went to my closet and pulled out a perfectly good shirt. <laughs> now, now, here's the thing, and I probably should have said it a little bit different in the beginning. When the woman called for a prayer cloth, she didn't say, we knew it was for her father, but we didn't know what was wrong. We didn't know about the withered arm. My wife didn't know anything about what was wrong. She took the, the shirt, cut the sleeves off, and sent the whole sleeve. Now, can you imagine opening a package and there's a sleeve, right? <laughs> and this man was in an um, elderly care facility. And so when, they got, when the lady got the package, she took the sleeve out. She took it to her dad and just so happened my wife had sent a left sleeve and it was just so happened it was his left hand right so you talk about being led by the spirit don't even know most of the time you're led you don't even know it and you won't know it till you get to heaven unless God shows you something amen and so don't that's, that's none of your concern your concern is just to do the word that's what we're told be doers of the word and if you do the word guess what you'll get the ones God wanted you to get right and so she took that sleeve and pulled it up on his arm pinned it to his shirt and said, I'll be back tomorrow, Dad. And then she told the nurses, do not take that off of him. Leave it on him. Now, here's a man sitting in a T-shirt with a sleeve pinned to the side. <laughs> nurses thought she was crazy. But she goes out, comes back in the next day. He's sitting across the room. When she walks in the door, he looks at her and starts waving at her. <laughs> Amen. Amen. 
So, now, the amazing thing is, that shirt had been to the cleaners. It had been washed. It had been pressed. You can't even wash the power of God out. <laughs> Amen? Now, after that, we had another lady call in, and we sent a handkerchief to her. She got it. She was a member of a uh, cancer support group. People had had cancer right then, and they were dying one by one. And so we sent this cloth to this woman. We didn't know she was part of that group. She got it, and she had a brain tumor, which was cancer. She put the cloth on her head and wore it. She put the cloth on, and then she put a cap on. She'd already lost all of her hair due to chemo and all that kind of stuff. And so she put the cloth on and then put the cap down. She wore it for, I think, a little over a week and a half. It was completely healed. The tumor was gone. She was completely healed of cancer. She went back to her support group, told them what happened. They said, where's the cloth? <laughs> She took the cloth, started passing it through. Each one of them took it and wore it, and every one of them got healed. Amen. Every one of them got healed. Amen. Now, now that, again, that was, a, that was just a, a, a cloth, just a piece of cloth. Amen? And so, but why? Now, notice, you, you all know the story about the woman that came up behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. And then people have made a big deal out about it being the hem and that kind of stuff. No, no, no. The big deal was virtue went out of him. It went out of him. It did not fall on the woman with the issue of blood. It went out of him and healed her. Amen? And that's what you have to remember. Now, and as he, uh, because that life virtue went out, then her testimony went all around. It said that his fame grew. Amen? And then a few chapters later, it, I think that's what Matthew 9 and then in Matthew 14, it says that everybody sought to touch him. Why? They heard the testimony. You mean I don't have to ask for prayer? Well, I mean, come on, if I go ask him, he may say no. But because he told the Syrophoenician woman, no, I don't want to get a no. But if I don't have to ask, all I got to do is walk up and touch him and, and I can get it. Think about that. That was a big breakthrough. That means I can go get it. I don't have to get permission. Yeah. I can choose to go get it. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Why? That's what faith does. That when Jesus turned around, he said, woman, your faith has made you whole. And then he said, go, now get this. He said, go and be free, whole of thy plague. And the word plague there in the Greek is a word mastix. And it literally is the word that was used for the Roman flagellum, which was the cat of nine tails that they used to whip. So what he was actually saying was, woman, you are made whole, you're free from your whipping. Why? Because in a few days, he was going to take the whipping for her. He was going to take the whipping for every person. But notice her plague, her issue of blood for, for 12 years was a whipping of the devil. Do you get it? How do we know that? Well, because he said over and over again, different. well, again, I don't have time to get into all the details. Again, this is going to be in the Healing in the Atonement book. That's what, you know, keep going back to that. Because if you get that, once you understand healing is in the atonement and that becomes a, a rule of law for you, everything gets easy. Because then it's just a matter of finding the people that need it and giving it to them. Amen? And then choosing just to release life out. Um, there's so much more. Even right now. See, listen. My words are spirit and they are life. Why? Because I'm saying his words. Yeah. Jesus said his words are spirit and life. Isn't that right? He says, listen. He's, he says, in uh, Proverbs chapter 4, he even tells us, he said, get this word. With all that getting, get understanding. But he said, meditate on these words. Let this word be in you. He said, his words are what? Health and life to all their flesh. Not to their spirit. Health and life to their flesh. Do you get that? Why? And Jesus was word made flesh. So his words were spirit. So as you say spirit, that spirit, it's a spirit of life. As you speak the words of life, the words of the gospel, the words of Jesus, you're speaking spirit, you're speaking life, that spirit and life is going out, and any of you can grab it any time. You don't have to wait for me to lay hands on you. You can just choose to get healed. Why? Because faith comes by hearing the word. And you can hear the word and choose not to receive it. And it won't profit you not mixing it with faith. But if you hear the word, faith comes by hearing the word. When, when the word is, is preached, faith is with it. Whatever word is preached, the faith is available right then to appropriate whatever is being preached. So what if you came and we're talking about healing, now you can get whatever healing you need from it. It could be spirit, soul, body. It could be you know, finances, relationships, any of that. Because God is very holistic in the sense that he's a total God. And he wants all of you healed, spirit, soul, and body, head to toe, every bit, right? But as I'm speaking, you can hear it and you go, you know what? That's true. I believe that. I can be healed. I'm healed now in Jesus' name. And just take it. 
and it'll come right out of you. Why? Because I would rather you get that than you wait for my hands. Because if you get it from me laying hands on you, you'll have a real strong tendency to go out and talk about, oh, Brother Curry, and he was here, and this, and you talk about, you bring my name up. But if you can get it where you're sitting, yeah. you go out of here talking about Jesus, and he's the one that does it. Yeah. Amen? I'd much rather you get it. Because, listen, if you get it under my hands, next time I come around, if I come back, if you let me, but if I, next time, okay, I've been invited a lot of places one time, believe it or not. Anyway, I don't know why, but they don't love me. I don't know why. But come on, what's not to love? Come on, really? No, anyway, okay, so, but if you get it through, through that, then you'll go, oh, Brother Curry's back in town. Come on, grab some sick people. Let's go over there. That's not God's will. God's will is that when I leave, you take this and run with it and go do it, and you tell them, well, Oh, yeah, I got healed because Jesus healed me. If he healed me, he'll heal you. Yeah. And so you just, you just give it away. I, I'm not going to be here but tonight, you know, on this trip. So I can't go around. I'd love to be here long enough to go visit your friends, your relatives, and lay hands on them and, you know, just see amazing move of God through all the Salt Lake City area. That'd be awesome. But I'm not here at this time. So you've got to take it. You've got to run with it. Why? Because Christianity is about your relationship with God. Yeah, Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. Not, not me, not a preacher, nobody. Amen? So there's a direct connection. So we gotta, I got to hurry here. Sorry. I'm used to doing three-day seminars. I'm used to preaching, you know, 15, 16, 20 hours, you know, eight hours a day, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm really cutting down and condensing. So, but I am talking faster, so it's still getting similar there. Okay? So now, Okay. People ask me, how can you talk so fast? I pray in tongues a lot. <laughs> and it, and it, it'll make your tongue faster. That's just the way it works, okay? Yeah, okay. Now watch. That's just one of the benefits, but it's a good one, especially if you're a preacher. It's a good benefit, all right? So, <clears throat> which, by the way, that means that if you buy my CDs, you get like a CD and a half on, on every one of them. We, you, get, you get more words per CD than the average preacher. And I'm from Texas, and down in Texas... We got preachers that'll talk like this. <laughs> and they don't even give you a whole sermon in there. And, and with me, you get a sermon and a half, sometimes two. It just depends, right? So, now, all right, we're back. Nope, still with that woman. I'm not going to leave that woman alone. All right, now, okay. <laughs> so, now, so I got her up, and she was walking, and she, I mean, literally, it was like this, and it wobbling. And so, but remember, and I keep saying this, life comes out, okay? Life emanates. You ever see the old pictures of like Moses and people like that? I'm talking about old, old pictures. It shows light coming out of his head. You know, it's got this light and it's some, then they went to the halo and all that stuff. That isn't just made up. Light comes out and you, and you can, and, and we are the light of the world and light emanates from us, but you just can't see it because it's on a higher spectrum to the point where the human eye can't pick it up. But every now and then, you can move into that spectrum by faith and by in the spirit, and you'll actually see it. And you can kind of see yeah. things, right? And that's why you see angels. Angels sometimes slow down enough where you can see them. Otherwise, they're too fast, right? And so, when it, but life, com, it comes out of you in every direction. Remember, uh, what's it, Acts 5? Yeah, uh, where Peter, uh, they, they said God was doing all these miracles, and Peter, in so much that they brought people out into the streets, and laid them on couches and beds and things in so much that the sh Peter's shadow might overshadow. Remember that? So what? Why did that happen? Why was that big deal? Because you will find out that the Spirit of God emanates from you, usually the distance, on the average, of the distance of your hands in every direction. I can't go any further than that. Sorry. But this far. Okay? You get that? In other words, around you, the Spirit of God emanates from you. And, and the more you pray in tongues, the more you talk about the Bible, the more you uh, build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, but the, more, the stronger that gets and the further out it goes. And then, like in Catherine Kuhlman's meetings, people would step in the building and bam, get healed coming in the, the door. And they go, oh, oh, it's the anointing. Yeah, kind of, but no. All right? I mean, kind of, but not exactly. It was the fact that she had built up to a place where her, her, the, the Spirit of God in her was able to emanate far enough to impact people. See, this, you already do this, and you might not even know it, but you'll be standing in line, somebody will walk up behind you. You don't hear them, you don't see them, but you feel them. You know why? Because their spirit hit your spirit. And boom, you look. Okay, here's a fast way to do it. I'll, I'll, I'll prove this to you. 
what they will tell you in the military, if you're a, any type of uh, combat soldier, they will tell you, never stare. I'll give you an example. Never stare at the sentry you're going to take out. Why? Because if you stare at them when you're moving toward them, they will sense it, especially if you're coming up behind them because they can sense it. And so whenever you move toward them, so you don't stare at them because they'll sense it and turn. So you have to look on the ground or somewhere around them where they're in your peripheral, but not staring. Why? Because their spirit will pick that up. We're talking about the human spirit. But now take the human spirit and see, new age people, they have an idea about this because they talk about auras. The aura is just nothing but the human spirit extended out. But you got the human spirit that goes so far, and then you can energize that even stronger by praying in tongues, reading the word, confessing the word, all these things, to make it where it even extends further out. And so you can do that. That's why when you get near some people, you can sense it. And whenever, and the thing is, whenever you get near people, you hit your spirits hit, and it's an automatic adjustment of, okay, who is the most powerful? That's what that's what goes on. You're fine pulling cords out. You're finding uh, you're finding your rank, so to speak. And so that's why, listen, I don't care what people tell you. You have to realize when you walk into a room, if you're a Christian, especially if you're the only Christian there, you are the highest spiritual authority in that room. I don't care who else is in there. I don't care what is going on. I don't care if there's a demon there. I don't care if there's a principality there. I don't care what's there. You are the highest spiritual being there. And then immediately, okay, a uh, member of the uh, seven sons of Sceva. Yeah. Remember that? They go in, uh, we adjure thee by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Oh, yeah, Jesus I know, Paul I know. Who are you? What does that mean? Jesus and Paul had a reputation in hell. These seven sons didn't. You get that? And then the, when they got what they wanted. They cast out the devil. It jumped on them. It came out of the guy, but it jumped on them. That's not exactly the way they wanted it. But then, and then it stripped them down and chased them down the street naked. Now think about that. So what you got to do is you got to develop a reputation in hell. See, when you develop a reputation in hell, when you go to pray for somebody, they'll be well before you get there. Why? Because that reputation will precede you. And they'll hear it and those demons will leave because they don't want to be there. Why do they leave? Because if they leave on their own, generally they can come back. But if, if they are there, when you get there and you cast them out, you can keep them out. Unless the person, of course, goes in back into the sin or whatever it was to get them. But I'm saying, generally speaking, Jesus said, when you cast out a spirit, it goes out into the dry places, walks around, trying to find rest, finding none. It decides to go back to its home, to its house. It sees you as a house. And it will come back in. And when he comes back and finds you all clean and nice, he brings seven more worse. And now you're worse than you were to begin with. Now, notice that, though. Now, what that means is that this, this, these demons, they can be cast out or they can go on their own. They, they can choose to go on their own or they can... And when you see one in manifestation, usually it's because it was gone and it just came back. Yeah. And it visits. And you'll notice there are cycles. The, the main cycle you'll see in this in both demons and disease, 21 days. Mm. That, that, it takes 21 days to break a habit or form a habit. Why? 21 days to keep that devil off or to get it back in. And, and it's not, that's not the only one. There's 21 days, there's 40 days, there's different lengths of days for different things that happen. But regardless, the key about that is not worrying about the cycle. The thing is to know this. You have authority over all sickness, all disease, and all devils to cast them out. Not to converse with them, not to carry on and try to videotape it so you, you know, be a big hit on YouTube, but you are to cast them out and they must yeah. obey. That's one of the things I do before every service is I will just usually either say it or decide to believe. See, the believing is important more than the prayer. I can believe and not pray and the believe will work. I can pray and not believe and even if I pray, it still won't work. Right. Why? Because I don't believe. Believing is what counts. Amen? Amen? And so, but what we do is I always enforce no manifestations. During the meetings, no manifestations. During the teaching, no manifestations. During the uh, healing service. Unless, of course, there needs to be a demonstration. And that demonstration is the authority of Jesus over that thing and not a... That, that thing doesn't determine that. I determine that. Amen? But you don't play with them. 
you're in authority over them and yeah. you can you command them to do what you want them to do. Amen? Which is to go. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. So, very quick. Yes, very quick. Okay. Uh, I wanna, well, let's finish up with the woman. Okay. <laughs> so, I was walking with her and I know that life emanates from me. So, at first, I had her like this, okay? But then I wanted more life into her. Why? Because I'm trying to give her muscles strength because she was atrophied. So I did this. Why? More contact. See? More contact, more absorption. Yeah. Best way to say it. And so, because I'm emanating the power of God, but now I'm emanating more into her. Now, this is why Elijah goes in and lays down on the boy that was dead. He laid across the boy. Why? Life. Head to head, toe to toe, that kind of thing. Life goes into him. Amen? So you can see this all through the Bible. Just people don't realize it, okay? Um, Elijah, 16 miracles. Elisha, supposed to be 32, right? He only had 31 when he died. Only 31 miracles. But he was promised 32. And so then after he was dead and in the grave, some guys come by and they saw some soldiers and they took the dead body that was with them and they threw them into the, the tomb there and immediately uh, the dead man came to life and took off running, and then passed the guys that, were, that dumped him in the grave. I mean, now, if you don't, now think about that. You're running from soldiers, and the dead guy passes you. You wouldn't know which way to run. Do, do you, which way, do I follow the dead guy, or do I, you know, I mean, just, I mean, you have to realize this stuff really happened, right? But now notice, people, I've heard people say, oh, look at the anointing in Elisha's bones. So much anointing. No. It's not about Elisha. Everything in the Old Testament was to glorify Jesus. It was about God's faithfulness to keep his word to a man even after he was dead. Come on. Why? Because God is faithful. Amen? Listen, don't you worry about your faith. Everybody, oh, I've got to have faith, got to have great faith. Gotta... No, no, don't worry about your faith. If you're worried about your faith, you're into humanism. Because you're still in, it's still you. Right. Forget that. Don't, don't worry about it. Your faith is in God. Have faith in God. Well, how do you do that? His faithfulness. He's the easiest person ever to, to have faith in. He's never failed. He's never lied. He's, he, he's still got the same power he's ever had. And people, well, I'm trying to believe. You just call God a liar. Well, I'm trying to have faith. Oh, I know it's so hard to believe such a perfect person. You know, I mean, come on. He's never failed. He's never told a lie. You can totally believe him, but the problem is we've been told what faith is to the point where we treat it like it's money, and if I get enough faith, I can get whatever I want from God. No, 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 it's not money. If it was money, Jesus couldn't have, if it was like currency, it, Jesus couldn't have told us that a faith the size of a grain of mustard seed would move a mountain. He would have said, you have to build up to this and get to that, and then you can do it. But see, the church does it backwards. Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can command a mountain to move, and it'll obey you. The church generally says, if you have faith the size of a mountain, you can tell a tumor the size of a mustard seed to go. And it's just the opposite. But the fact is, our faith is in God. It's not about your faith. It's not about how much faith I have, how much faith you have. No, no, it's how faithful he is. And when you, when you count him faithful, this is what God said about Sarah, that he, he, she counted him faithful. And that's what got her in Hebrews 11. He said, that's faith. When you count me faithful... That's faith. Yeah. So forget about your faith and just count him faithful. He is faithful to keep his word. Amen? Amen. And all you got to figure out is, did he say he's going to do it or that he has done it? Yeah. That's the only thing you got to figure out. Because if you try to say he's going to do something, he said he's already done, you're not in faith. Do you get that? So you have to decide. And Till Osborne used to say, um, there's two things never ask God to do. Number one, never ask him to do what he told you to do. And number two, never ask him to do what he said he's already done. Pretty simple, huh? So all you got to do is go through the Bible and look at the tenses. Is it past tense, present tense, future tense? What's the tense? And, and well over 80% of the New Testament is all past tense in the sense of how it's written that Jesus has already done it. Amen? So if you're going to be in faith, you're going to have to consider it done, not consider it going to be done. Amen? All of you in here, you were healed 2,000 years ago. Yeah. By his stripes, you were healed. My job is just to be the delivery guy and bring it to you, right? And if there's somebody there trying to keep it from happening, I've got to cast them out. It's kind of simple, isn't it right? I just got to get to the right person, get you to sign for the package. 
right? And all I'm doing is bringing it to you. Amen? Isn't that simple? Amen. You can do this. Anybody can do this. Why? Because we're just believers. And that's all we got to be. So, all right. The woman. Now, <laughs> I was walking with her. And so I was doing this. And like I said, if we, now, I don't embrace women and that kind of stuff because it's inappropriate. But if you could do that with somebody, they'd get healed even quicker. Theoretically, right? Okay? Now, so I had her like this and was putting life into her. And I'm walking with her. And see, people that haven't walked in a while, they always look down. It's amazing. When they try to walk, they're looking down. They always look down like they're afraid they're going to fall because that's in their mind. So the first thing you have to do is tell them, no, no, no. And while I told her, I said, look, look here, up here, look up here. Your help is up here. It's not down there. There's nothing down there. I'm going to fall before you do, right? You're not going to fall. Everything's good. And so I had to get her head up. Why? Because a down head is a shame face. And I tried to get her looking up, amen, to God because he was the one that was helping her. So I'm walking with her and I'm doing this. And as we walk, I gradually come back down to here. And when I get down to here, why? Because she's, she's healed. She's just not strengthened. So I'm walking and I said, all right, look at you. You're walking, you're walking. And so then I dropped one hand and I knew she was going to do it at first. When I dropped that one hand, she's kind of like this way because she was, there was no pressure here, but she was used to it. And in her mind, she was using me as a brace. So I dropped the one hand, and she kind of did that. And I said, that, look, at you. you're still walking. Said, oh, look, oh, look, oh, look, look at you, look at you. And she's just walking. And behind me was her family. And she looked and looked and looked at them and literally ran past me and went into their arms, and they were hugging her, right? And I mean, so now, and in that, all of a sudden, the people there went wild because they all knew her. And they, they had known her this whole time. And so they knew for a fact this woman was healed. And she, then they go back down and everybody's clapping, screaming, hollering, and everybody's happy. Me, I got to be the wet blanket, right? And so I said, wait, wait, stop, you know, stop. Everybody got quiet and looked. And I said, this is the shame and it's an indictment on the church. I said, because this woman was in this chair for seven years. And all I did was cast out a spirit of infirmity, which is the smallest little imp. Any one of you could have done it seven years ago. This woman was in a chair because you wouldn't do your job. You know, and most people, well, you would think you'd have just been happy she got healed. No, I'm not happy just that she got healed. I'm glad she did. But at the same time, the church has to grow up and be the body of Christ. Amen? It has to be. Listen, as long as, as, long as there's just a few people doing this, Guess what? See, don't think I'm being super nice and all that stuff. When you're one of the few people that's actually doing it on a regular basis, that makes you a big target. But if I can get all you doing it, (laughs) he just has to pick his shots a whole lot better. You see what I'm saying? He's got a whole lot more targets to cut. Amen. But God wants everybody doing this. Now, and so, it's, and now the, here's the thing, though. Here's something that you need to hear. This is principle. She got healed. She went back toward that chair, that wheelchair. And I told her, I said, do not sit back down in that chair. I said, you get back in that chair, you'll be trapped there the rest of your life. I said, do not use that chair. And so her husband closed that thing up and pulled it around behind him. And he took her by the arm and they started to walk out. And as they did, there was a lady there that worked with me and she was about my height, so she was on a chair at the back watching because she couldn't see over everybody. And so... She... <laughs> and I was there with a friend of mine who was about six foot tall. And so, anyway... <laughs> no. But she was watching these people go back, and as the woman started to walk back, as she was walking, she started wobbling again. And you can see it. And I couldn't see her because the crowd was there. But that woman at the back, all of a sudden I heard this yell. That woman said, no, in Jesus' name, walk right. And that woman that was doing this, she goes. <laughs> and now, I mean, literally changed. Now, why? Because when you're used to something, you have to retrain yeah. the muscles. So you have to work people in. See, people go, well, if it was Jesus, if it was God, they should just jump up and take off running. I got pictures. I can show you people that jump up and take off running. Out of wheelchairs, jumped. I mean, I had to move out of his way because he jumped past me and took off running around the church and had been that way many years, had cerebral palsy and Parkinson's. You think that's a combination. And this man was withered up and small and thin and 
all that. And he ran around the church a couple of times and ran out the door and then ran down the street. And his caretaker had to get in the van and chase him down to bring him. I'm not kidding. San Diego, right outside of San Diego, uh, in a place called Santee, uh, California, uh, that happened. And so things do happen like that. But a lot of times people have to be retrained how to function. And they'll start, it'll, that thing will try to come back on them. So tonight when you get ministered to, no, the thief comes immediately to steal the word that was sown in your heart. He's going to try to, now see, that's why I tell you, whenever I minister to you, whatever you couldn't do, I'm going to get you to do it. If you couldn't walk, you're going to walk. If you couldn't breathe deep, you're going to breathe deep. Whatever it is you couldn't do, you're going to do. Why? Because then when the devil comes back and says, oh, that was just emotion. Oh, that was just whatever. No, if that was just emotion, you couldn't do what you couldn't do before. Do you understand? But once you've done it, then you have some ammunition to go, uh, devil, uh, I had to come in here with crutches, but now I ain't got them. So how is that not real? You see, you have to get people to do what they couldn't do so they have ammunition to use against the devil when he comes because he's going to try to come So, because he tries to come and steal what was sown into you. Amen? Yeah. And so now, so that finally got through with the woman's story. Okay? So now we're going to finish this up and we'll be done. I'm going to move quick. So we were in Luke chapter 13. Did y'all remember that? We're still there. Okay? Now, Jesus said, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And notice, this is a command. Isn't that right? It's a statement. Okay? And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue, uh, the synagogue answered with indignation. He, notice he answered. He answered what? A healing. With indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered, then answered him and said, you hypocrite, do not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought, now notice, and ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, right? Lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Now notice this. He said, whom Satan hath bound. Now that word bound comes from the word, it's, a, it's an elongation of the word bind. It's the exact same Greek word when it says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, now notice, where does the binding and loosing start? On earth. Whatever you bind on earth will be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? When a child of God speaks, heaven hears and agrees. Hell hears and obeys. Do you understand that? So you bind or loose here. Now, what that means is very simply this. Now, there's, there's words used, but to bind means to forbid. Okay? So when it says, whom Satan hath bound, he had forbidden her. Do you get that? that in, a, in a rough way of speaking, he had forbidden her. And he said, shouldn't, Jesus said, shouldn't she be loosed? And that literally means, shouldn't she be permitted? That's all it means. So when, he says, when it says that we are to bind or loose, it just means you permit or you forbid something to happen. Amen? And so that, it's the same words used. So don't think it's some special thing. It's the same words. And you can bind or loose. Just like Jesus loosed her, you can loose people. Because the word loose actually means to untie or to let go or to set free. But to bind means to tie up. Now, and so when Satan bound, he, he tied people up, right? Now, try to move quick. Um, dip, dip, okay. In uh, John chapter 5, verses 1, actually 1 through 9, it goes through there. The man had the infirmity for 18, or um, for, for uh, 38 years. You notice that? 38 years he had an infirmity, a weakness for 38 years. Jesus gave him a command. Take up your bed and walk. Now, Luke chapter 6, verse 17. It says that all the people sought to touch him because virtue. Now, the word virtue there is a Greek word, dunamis. And it means power, literally means miraculous ability. All right? Now think about this. He said, miraculous ability came out of him. And it said here, all the people sought to touch him, okay? Because, and when it says it came out of him, it meant literally it issued out of him. It issued out of him, right? Now, notice this though. They all sought to touch him. Because virtue, dunamis, miraculous ability came out of him. All right? Why did it come out of him? 
because he had the Holy Spirit. You get that? Okay, now watch. In um, yeah, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You hear that? Jesus was doing what he told us we would do. You shall receive power, a dunamis, miraculous ability. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You have the exact same power Jesus had. His authority is now your authority. You don't have, okay, I don't have authority as Curry Blake. And he doesn't say, you got this much, you got this much, you over there, you got this much. He doesn't dole out different. If that's true, now think about this. If it's true that each of us have a certain amount of authority that we have somehow gained, usually because people think if we do good works or we do something good or something, then he's going to give us more authority. Okay. Now, it says that if we've been faithful over one city, he'll give us five. If we've been over five, he'll give us authority over ten. Is that right? Yes. That's not now. Okay. What, that, what I'm saying is this. If you're faithful now over one, when he comes, he's coming with his reward, reward in his hand, and he'll put you over five. Then, you, you understand. Now, you can grow and have authority over more areas, and when he comes, he will increase that. You understand that? But it, that's not what's happening right now. Right now, because you have to understand this. If you are going in your authority, then when you pray for the sick, you should be saying in my name, your name, not the name of Jesus. Why? He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, you go in my name. Isn't that right? So what do we use? We use his name. So if we use his name, we have his all authority. There is none of his authority you don't have access to. Now, you may not be walking in all of it, so you may have to grow into it, but that's how much you have access to. And the more you grow into it, the more you understand authority, the more faith you'll walk in, the more you'll get done because you will understand authority and it will function for you. So your job is to grow into the full authority of Jesus. Why? Because we are, according to Ephesians chapter 4, that we are to grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You get that? So our job is to grow up into him. We are supposed to be in the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Amen? This is not about what us. See, we keep making about us. Here's how faithful I've been, and he's given me this power, and he's given me this. No, no, no. It's all about him. Every bit of it's about him. And the more you get out of the way and just let him do what he did when he was here in the flesh, the more you look like him. Amen? And so there, it's, an, it's an understanding that you have his name, therefore his authority, which is total. That means no devil can resist. That means no sickness can resist. No disease can resist. Amen? Amen. That means no mountain can stand before you. Cancer can't stand before you. Leukemia can't stand before you. HIV can't stand before you. Why? Amen. Because it must bow its knee to the name Amen. that's above all names, which the church, we, are named after him. Yeah. You realize the name of Jesus is not just his name. Why? Because you are one with him. And because you're one with him, now it's our name. So, see, women understand this better than men. Why? Because generally they take the man's name and they write checks. <laughs> so you got it. You understand what I'm talking about, right? Well, you start to write your husband's name and that last name on there. You start to write, you don't think, well, should I, can I do this? I don't know if I can. You know, I'm sorry, men, I have to tell your wife that she has permission to write your name. I'm sorry. But does that make sense, though? It's the same thing. Why? Because we are one with him. It's amazing how one we are. Because, and, and it's too often we separate ourselves from him. Well, you know, well, well, now, brother, you just gave me a word now. Was that, was that you or was it Jesus? Yes. Yes, it was. It was me and him. Why? Because he talks through me. We're one together. Amen? But, and people say, well, but how, what kind of union? You want me to show you how, how great a union you have with him? When Saul was killing the church, just going through, arresting people, putting them in prison, causing people to be killed, all that stuff. Here he goes to Damascus. Jesus shows up, blinds him because of his brightness. Amen? And the first thing, uh, you know, for, it's funny because Jesus tells him, says, Saul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He said, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, Lord, who are you? And he said, and now notice, he said, Jesus did not say, 
why are you persecuting the church? He said, why are you persecuting me? Lord, who are you? Do you you get that? Jesus said, listen, if they hear you, they hear me. If they reject you, they reject me. Do you get it? That's how close you are. That's how united you are. That's how he sees it. When you gave your life to him, he believed you. He didn't think about you holding anything back. And so he made himself available to you. And the beauty of it is, as he is, so are we in this world. We become so much one that, you know, there's this thing, and I talk about this up in Portland, as a matter of fact. There's this thing in science called the duality theory. And then in, in the duality theory, they say if there's these two dimensions, that if there was, and I like the illustration because I used to like to play pool. I don't get to anymore, but used to when I played pool, it, this stuck with me. And in this duality theory, if there was a pool table in this dimension and then another pool table in another dimension that are connected, if there's a way to connect them, which there is, it's called string theory, there's, you can actually connect them. And so now, if I, so according to duality theory, whatever I do on this pool table, if I break the balls and they scatter in that other one, they will also break and scatter exactly the same way. So what I do in this dimension actually happens in that dimension too. Now think about that. That's why whatever we bind on earth is bound in another dimension called heaven. Do you understand that? that that's how, why? Because it's connected. Now, he is, we are connected to him. We have that same connection together and we are able to function as he functions. Amen? And whatever we do here, as the saying says, echoes in eternity. Amen? Why? Because we are so connected to him, but we, we refuse to believe it sometimes. And we talk about, well, you know, Jesus come down. All you're saying is you're not born again. Because you say, well, well Jesus, we want you to show up. I got good news for you. He did when I walked in the door. Why? Because I brought him with me. <laughs> Amen? Hopefully you brought him with you. Amen. Amen? But see, people don't like talk like this. It makes them nervous. Yeah. Oh, he thinks he's Jesus. No, Jesus thinks I'm Jesus. I'm just trying to, you know. <laughs> you know? Amen. Does that make sense to you? I mean, I, I'm, I know. I know that without him, I can do nothing. Amen. But why focus on that when I'm with him and I can do all things? Yes. Amen? Why focus on what I could do if I didn't have him? Maybe like somebody saying, well, you know, if I didn't have a car, I couldn't have got here. <laughs> well, yeah, but how'd you get here? Well, in my car. <laughs> so why are you talking about not having a car? Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're just idle talking. That's what you're doing. You're idle talking, and you're going to be held accountable. Why? Because you're considering yourself separated. That's Amen? Yeah, there you go. Amen? Yeah, amen? Do you get that? Do you see this? Oh, if you ever see your connection to him. If you ever see how much he trusts you. You know, we talk about trusting him. You have to know how much he trusts you. Do you realize he gave you his name, his power, his spirit, his word? I mean, come on. He's given us all things. And said, now, here, I've given you my name, my power, my spirit. I'm giving you all this. Now, show me what you want to do with it. Show me how much you trust me. Yeah. Glorify my heavenly father. See, and we're, well, I don't want to do anything to be seen. That's exactly why you're supposed to do things. He said, do your good works before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. Well, I just don't want to be seen. That's a devil talking. Amen? It's not about ego. It's about you doing your job. Amen? It's about you doing what you're supposed to do. Why? Because if you're not going to do your job, people aren't going to be free. Jesus is not just... Out, you notice this? He's not just out there just healing people. He's trying to get you to be out there so he can heal people. Why? Because you're his hands. You're his feet. You're his mouth. And, and, and as a matter of fact, we talked earlier about being led by the Spirit. And everybody wants to be led. And, they, and it's amazing because they want to be led perfectly. You know, it's kind of like, oh, well, I just want to walk alone. And okay, we're going to go this way. Okay, no, nope, no, nope, we're going to go back this way. And people think that's the way I want to be led many times. But that's not the way he says to lead. God even said, he said, don't be like the horse that has to have a bridle in your mouth, meaning that's how you get led around. You have to jank on the reins this way and that way, and you lead the horse. He said, no, no, no. He said, I will guide you with my eye. What does that mean? You're going to see people the way I see them. And when you see them hurting, you're going to know you can fix them. Whenever you see them hungry, you can know that you can feed them. See, we, we, we have this whole thing just so backwards. And then we talk about about leading. And in Romans chapter 8, the only time it ever talks about leading, really, the only time. And he says, 
as many as are, now let me get this, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. You say, well, there you go. That's pretty good. Yeah, we'll go back and look at it because it, what it actually says in the Greek is this, as many as are constantly led, they are the sons of God. But then look at the context. It's not about healing the sick. All of Romans 8 has nothing to do with healing the sick. It's all about you mortifying the deeds of the flesh. He's saying as long as you're being led by the Spirit to kill the deeds of the flesh, you know you're a child of God. Amen. That's all he's saying. He is, he, nowhere does he tell you only do what you feel led to do. He never says that. He says obedience. Obedience. Do what I told you. He said you hear my words and you do them. And if you hear my words and you do them, you're a smart person because you have built your house on the rock. And it will stand no matter what comes. But if you hear my words and don't do them, you're a fool. Why? Because you have built your house on sand. And any storm that comes along is going to crash your house. Only two places there. Hear and do, hear and don't. You get to decide. Well, Lord, you didn't lead me. Where was that at? Is there anything in there that says, He that hears my words and is led to do them. Now, see, that's... This is, a, this is a small thing that we built into the thing. And the, and the thing is simply doing his word. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say do it when you're led. He just said, keep my commandments. Isn't that simple? Yeah. He even gave us a promise. He said, if you, if, you hear, if you teach my words, you teach my commandments, and you do them and you teach them, you'll be great in the kingdom. But he said, if you teach people not to do them, you'll be least in the kingdom. Well, who wants to be least in the kingdom? Come on. You know, well, I'm just glad to get in. No. When Jesus comes, he's looking for fruit. Fruit is seed that has grown. Don't be the person that hides the talent. Lord, you're a tough man, and I knew it. And You know, you gave me this talent, but I hid it. I didn't lose any of it. And he's going to say, yeah, you're about to lose it right now. Take that from them. Give it to this one that has much. Take him out and beat him. I'm just telling you what Jesus said in his parable. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. We have a responsibility to do his word. Yeah. Whether you feel like it, whether you don't. It's amazing. Smith Wigglesworth said, to ask God for power after you have received the Holy Spirit is to insult God. He said, you have power. You need to act. John Lake said, it is a law of the human mind that I can act myself into believing faster than I can believe myself into acting. Isn't that something? Yeah. And the world knows that. The world calls it, uh, was it, uh, modeling. You know, when you model somebody, when you watch somebody, and you just do what they do, and, and, you, and you actually can, and, and if you go to these uh, life coaches and stuff, they'll tell you, well, I'm suffering from depression and I'm suffering this. You know what they're going to tell you? Because when you walk in, you're going, yeah, I'm just depressed. I don't know what's going on. And they're going to go, okay, I'll fix you. First, stand up straight. Put your shoulders back. Raise your head up. When you change the physical body, guess what? Your mental changes. That's why you can tell. See, this is what discipleship is. Till Osborne said there's three ways you've got to see Jesus. First, you've got to see him in the Bible. Then you've got to see him in a man so that you can imitate him. Then you got to see him in yourself. Amen. You see, that's the difference. You, we haven't emphasized discipleship, and we've been afraid to say, follow me as I follow Christ. But guess what? All you got to do is get your life clean. Just get your life clean, and then you won't be afraid to tell people to follow you. The only time we tell people, oh, don't look at me, don't do this. You know why? Because you're hiding something. Yeah. And you don't want to disciple people, because when you disciple people, they get in close, and they're going to see your faults. And guess what? I don't care how much you clean up your life, you're still going to have some faults. Why? Because you're still human at this point. Right? And I, I read stories about some of the things that people did, the wrong things that happened, that kind of stuff. And people say, well, doesn't that kind of douse your faith in those people? I said, well, I never had faith in those people anyway. I had faith in God. Yeah. I said, what that shows me is God can even use an imperfect vessel. Yeah. So there's hope for me. Yeah. Amen? Well, that's the way I feel about it. But I always know, if God did it for them, he'll do it for me. If he did it for Smith Wigglesworth, he'll do it for me. If he did it through Smith Wigglesworth, he'll do it through me. Why? Because he is, I perceive of a truth, God is no respecter of persons. But he is a respecter of faith. And if you trust him, he'll do great things to you. I, I've seen things, man, I wish I could show you the things I've seen. I, I've seen every part of the body healed. We've seen, I, I just, one man came one time, his 
you could see through. It, all this was eaten away for cancer. Half of his tongue was eaten away. It was horrible. Smelled horrible. It was, you wouldn't believe some of this stuff. You could see all the way into his mouth. The cancer just eaten away. And you see that, and, and you, you know, depends on where you are mentally. But you, you know, one part of you may go, okay, I'll send the word, be healed, you know. <laughs> but then all of a sudden you forget yourself. And all of a sudden Jesus rises up. Yeah. And you want to walk over there and grab him by one side of the head, and you want to put your hand right there on that cancer. Right there in all the middle of the mush and the goo and all that stuff. And you want to put your hand right on that. And you start saying, in the name of Jesus, be healed now. Amen. And then you pull your hand off and you come back the next day and there's all new skin. Yeah. We've seen that happen. There was a man that had blood poisoning in his foot and a big old hole in his foot and it's horrible. And they had already told him, that here's what's going to happen. We're going to have to cut off your leg here. Then they said, if it goes past that, we're going to have to cut off your leg at the hip. And then the blood poisoning had already gone to the other leg. We're going to have to get both legs. And then the wife called us and I was on a trip and they said, would you come by his house? Come by their house? And, I, and actually, they said, can we, get a, uh, can we get Brother Curry to call and pray? So I found out where they were at, and they were like, I don't know, 120, 150 miles out of the way to go. And I said, well, let's go by there. And it's me and my best friend. He was traveling with me at the time. And so we, we just, you know, cut down the road, cut across, and, you know, three hours later, we're pulling up at their house. And so we pull up in there, and I called the lady, and I said, yeah, this is uh, Brother Curry. I was going to see if we could pray. And, and I said, uh, we want to come to your house and pray. Oh, that's great. Well, where are you? I said, uh, your driveway. I'm in your driveway. And you see the curtain open. You can see her look. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. This. And she goes, uh, can, you, can you give me a few minutes? And I'm like, sure, go ahead. So we're sitting there talking. And then finally she opens the door and comes out. And we go in. This man's lying on the couch. He's got a blanket over him. But his leg is uncovered because he can't even stand the weight of a blanket. And he said anything. It, she turned one time, not while we were there, she turned on the fan across the room and the air, he started screaming because of the pain just from that. And so I get there and he's laying there and he said, yeah, I said, so this is what's going on. I'm looking. He goes, yeah, I said, so I'm going to pray. He said, yeah, please, please don't touch it. Apparently he read my mind because it's like I wanted to just go after that thing. But he probably would have passed out or something. And I'm like, okay, not going to touch it. And there's commanded. And actually, I didn't even, I didn't pray, and I didn't technically even command. I said, here's what's going to happen. That's going to heal up. I said, what you're going to see is the other leg where it is, is going to reverse. The way it had gone, it's going to reverse the other way. And when it gets back to here, that's going to heal up, and it'll all be good. And they're like, okay, okay. Well, I, I told the wife, I said, get pictures. Pictures now, pictures later. I said, do it quick. This is going to happen quick. And so she said, okay. So we left, and within two weeks, we got those pictures in the mail. And the whole thing was going on. All you could see was a line where it looked like it might have been a scar. But that was two weeks. Uh, another month after that, that wasn't even there. Completely healed up. There was a man that came to us. Uh, well, I could go on and on. We, we've seen God do just so many things. That's what I'm telling you. I, you know, I, I look around. I see everybody in the situation. I know some of you may have what doctors call terminal cancer. I got good news for you. Terminal is not in God's vocabulary. Amen. Amen. It's not in his vocabulary. Amen. So, now, but, but I will tell you, I, I don't see anything in this room that looks like it'd even be tough for God. I don't see anything in here that I hadn't already seen healed before, right? Because I've seen some stuff. And, and when I go to Africa, we got people on pallets uh, dying of HIV. They turn them out of the hospital because they don't want to record their death as HIV. It keeps their numbers down. And so they'll turn them out. And there was a guy got a picture on our wall at the church. Have y'all, y'all, where are y'all? I saw somebody here. Where are y'all? I don't see y'all now. There you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. You too. Y'all were down there at the faith. At the, right? Okay. Raise, raise your hand. Say that's, um, at least they know I'm actually talking to somebody. Okay. So, so, you know. <laughs> Who's he talking to? I don't know. They, they weren't there. But, but the, y'all saw the pictures? The, the, the four pictures of the guy and the pictures of the guy that ran out of the wheelchair and the medal in the back. Did we show the picture? Of the, the medal in the back? There was a lady that we, we were in uh, Grand Junction. That's not far from here, is it? Not too far, anyway. We were in Grand Junction several years ago. There was a lady that came to the healing service on Saturday night. She came up, didn't tell me what was going on, just said she had back problems. I laid hands on her. See, it's good not to know too much. If you, if, listen, if you ask too many questions, you get too many answers, and they will talk you out of faith. They'll talk you out. You'll think, well, I've never seen God do that, and so I don't know, you know. No, no, don't worry about that. Just, you know, what is your problem? Well, I got a back problem. I laid my hand on her back, commanded her back to be healed. 
I said, okay. She went home that night, went to bed, woke up the next morning. She had three pounds of surgical steel that had been put in her back lying in her bed. Came out of her back. I got pictures. They saw the pictures. They saw the pictures. I got, uh, and, and the picture shows where they brought this metal in and it, they had numbers on it because all these things have numbers because the doctor's, you know, surgical. And so she, she came in, brought it in, showed it to us, and then uh, took a picture of it and then took it back to the doctor. The doctor verified it was what, she, what he had put in her back, but there is no surgery to get it out. It came out in her bed. We, we've seen this stuff similar to this several times. One man had a steel bar in his back. God, at first, the man was bending, and we thought it's either turned to rubber or it's gone. It was gone. God took it out, a steel bar that kept his back straight. I'm telling you, there are no limits to God if we just take our limitations off of him. God can do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power, Holy Spirit, dunamis, that works in us. Amen? Amen. Above what we can ask or think. What does that mean? That means if you can form it into a prayer, it ain't big enough. God can do beyond whatever prayer you can form. God can do beyond that. Amen? If you can think of it, God can do more than that. So I guarantee you, whatever problem you got, you can think it. But God can do better. Amen? Y'all get that? Amen? Isn't that simple? It's simple. All right, finally. This is my third finally? I'm not sure. Anyway, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take you one place. Acts 10.38. And then we'll start ministering. And it's not going to take us long to minister to you because you're going to be ready to receive and we're going to get this done. Amen? Amen. Acts 10, 38. I do appreciate you coming out on a Tuesday night. I know this is kind of an unusual thing, but it was when we were coming back through, so it's about the best we could do at this time. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil... For God was with him. Why did he go about doing good? He went about doing good because God was with him. How did he go about doing good? Holy Ghost and power. Same Holy Ghost and power. When it says he anointed him with the Holy Ghost and power, it was Holy Ghost and dunamis. The same thing he said you will get whenever the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen? Same thing. Same power. Now, that word, oppressed. It's, you know, in English it's fairly long, but in Greek it's like this long. It's Karadunasteo, I think it is. And it literally, and the, the amazing thing about it is it means this. To have dominion exercised upon a person. Jesus went about healing people who had, who Satan had exercised dominion over. That's what it means. But yet he tells us, first off in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, that we are given dominion. Over everything on this earth, over everything that walks, crawls, swims. Guess what? Viruses can fly and swim. So we got authority over them. Come on. Anything that flies or swims, we got authority over. Anything that creeps upon the earth. Isn't that right? You have authority over creeps. <laughs> Think about it. That's, that's good, ain't it? I mean, come on. That's, but seriously, I mean, now, now think about this. So Jesus healed people who Satan was exercising dominion over. So our job is to do the same thing. So healing is Jesus exercising dominion over Satan who is exercising dominion. So our job is to exercise Jesus' dominion over the dominion of the devil. Now, in uh, Luke chapter 10, you don't have to go there, but in Luke, uh, yeah, Luke chapter 10 and verse 19 going to verse 20, he says, behold, I've given you power. And that word power is authority. Exousia, it means authority. Authority means the freedom to act. Okay? That's literally what it means. Yeah. And so he says, behold, I give you, and the King James says, behold, I've given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Now think about that. Now, the funny thing is, two words there for power are different Greek words. Totally different. You would think they would have specified but it literally says, behold, I give you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the ability of the enemy. Now, that word ability there is actually the same word dunamis, 
over all the dunamis of the, of the enemy. So actually what he's saying there was that I give you authority over the devil's ability. Does the devil have ability? Yes. Does the devil have authority? No. Why? Well, but I gave him authority. When I, no, no, wait. Okay. First off, you're not your own. You were bought with a price and you belong to Jesus. So if you're not your own, you don't have the authority to give the devil authority over you. Only Jesus can do that. So if the devil is exercising, now notice, the devil doesn't even have authority because Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. Is that right? If Jesus has all, the devil has none. The minute you give the devil authority by saying that, in other words, if you're saying you're giving it to him, you just said Jesus lied, he doesn't have all authority. Do you get that? Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. Now, and notice this, because he says, now, I've given you that authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the ability of the enemy. So the enemy has ability, he doesn't have authority. That's what makes him a liar and a thief, because thieves, thieves, thieves have ability to rob a bank, but they don't have the authority to withdraw money. That's what makes him a thief, right? The enemy... Satan is a thief. He does not have authority. He's lied to people and told them he has authority. But he doesn't have that authority. He's just got the ability. But our authority trumps his ability. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so the enemy has nothing there. And, he, and Jesus gave that to us. So that's the authority that we operate in. Then he said, but you shall receive ability after the Holy Ghost come upon you. So first he gave us authority. To as many as received him, gave he them authority to become the sons of God. That's when you got the authority. When you became a son, daughter, if you want to say so, you got authority, his authority. Why? Because you are in him. Now, when you receive the baptism of the Spirit, you receive the Spirit into your life in that sense, then now you have ability. So you not only have authority, now you have authority and the ability to back up the authority, and it's all self-contained in the sense that it is with you, in you, and just like a policeman has a badge and a gun, they can handle any situation, anytime. That's who you are. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen? You want to know your identity? That's your identity. You have authority. Why? Because you're a son. And you have to realize that. Listen, a son, okay, we got apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Those are functions. But us, and they are all geared to train and equip believers. But a son is the highest position in the kingdom. It's higher than apostle. It's higher than a prophet. It's higher than all that. Why? Because those are training positions. But a son is an inherited position. And why is it the highest? Because we are in the son. That he might have preeminence in all things. Amen? Are you getting this? Do you realize? I mean, if you ever just realize who you are. I'm telling you, you can't walk slouched over and depressed and all that. Come on. You, you can't. You walk, it's amazing. You walk through it. And I, one of the examples I like is this. Um, when I, I go to Ukraine every year, pretty much, and we go over and it's amazing times. And they always send this guy to meet us at the door of the plane. And he's uh, kind of a diplomat type guy. And so he comes over there and he's like this tall. He's not quite as tall as you, but he's cl- it's close. And, and he's, you know, he's a pretty, pretty big guy. And he comes over, and he's standing there at the door. And so we walk out. He holds his hands out. Now, I don't speak Russian. He, he doesn't really speak English. And so he, he holds his hand out. I put my passport in his hand, which is a scary thing anyway, handing over your passport to somebody in another country. And so I hand him my passport, and he turns around and walks. I mean, he's walking. And I'm running, trying to keep up with him, because I don't want him to get out of my sight, because he's got my passport. And so he walks, and we go, we skip all the lines. You see all these lines in the airport getting through customs? And he's got, he skips all those lines. He goes right to the diplomat thing. He walks by, puts him down, points at us, says something in Russian and, or Ukrainian, and then he turns around, and they look at him, they nod. He gathers them all up. He takes off. We walk right through. Don't have to go through nothing. I mean, it's amazing. Just walk through. And, you know, when you see that, it's funny. You could be sitting on that plane, 16, 20 hours, whatever it is, and you're, you're just exhausted. And then you get out, and you see that happen. And all of a sudden, you're kind of like, yes, bless God. <laughs> yes, I am here. That's right. You know, it's amazing, you know, how it makes you feel when they do that to you, right? And then, of course, when I leave, he's not there to see me out. And then there's this long line, and you're just kind of standing looking like, I shouldn't even be in this line. I should, I don't know what I'm doing here. 
but they just spoil you, you know. But you have to realize, we're a royal priesthood. You are royalty. Do you get that? Now, don't, don't do the, well, I'm a king's kid and be a spoiled brat. We're not talking about that. We're talking about being a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Amen? We're a kingdom of priests. But we're also kings and priests. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. Guess who, what, guess who those kings and lords are? It's us. Our problem is we've been living like paupers because we don't realize what kingdom we actually represent. When you start to say, I, I praise God because I was able to spend time with Dr. Lester Summerall and that changed everything for me. I mean, I, I learned, I was taught faith in, in uh, Tulsa, but I learned faith in South Bend with Dr. Summerall because I watched him. It wasn't just a formula. I watched him and he would tell, he'd go down the, the bank and say, we're, we're going to build this church and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And I mean, he would just tell them what we're going to, yeah, we're going to do this. And somebody would say, no, you can't do that, no, but this is what we're going to do. And he, it was just amazing to watch. He walked by faith and just the, because he walked with God. Of course, he walked with Smith Wigglesworth too, so he learned how to walk that out. But you realize that's what we're missing is the discipleship part. And because we don't have discipleship a lot of times, we have superstars and then we have everybody else. When we're all supposed to be superstars in, in that sense, you know, you, know, you know what I mean? We're all supposed to be doing the same thing. But it's just up to you. Amen? Amen. But this is stuff to dig into. Y'all get enough here to work on for a little while, you know, go through, work out, get the CDs or whatever. And, uh, you know, CDs, yeah, I know. I know, I'm old school. I know, it's not CDs anymore. But Hey, I wish they'd come back with cassettes. You know? I mean, at least a cassette. You take it out, you take it in the house, you put it in, it starts right where you took it out. You know? Come on. That's just, that was advanced way beyond its time, right? <laughs> so, anyway. So, yeah, we're going to uh, stop right there. Yep, we're going to stop right there. Okay. Uh, okay. Hopefully by now you've already decided you're going to get healed tonight. Yes. Amen? Because that's the first thing. You remember when Jesus said, wilt thou be made whole? Remember that when he asked the man, he went up to the man at the pool of Bethesda, John chapter 5. He went up to him and said, wilt thou be made whole? And the man, listen, don't be like the man. Well, every, every time I try to get in line, somebody gets ahead of me and I can't get in line and these people are going ahead of me. And I mean, Jesus didn't say, why aren't you healed? He said, do you want to be healed? And actually the word will there literally means, do you intensely desire to be healed? The man just started going off. Finally, Jesus just totally ignored him. Jesus was good about ignoring people. He was really good. He totally ignored him. And he just said, you yeah, know, just get up and go. Just, I ain't going to listen to you. Just go. Just get up and go. Get out of here. Amen? But you have to realize, you have to intensely desire. You, you have to say, this is it. And then you have to say, it's done, and it's done for me. It's mine. The Bible, where it even says to take, it literally means to take as one's own possession. The, the word receive literally means that, to take as one's own possession. Think about that. You have to decide tonight when he lays hands on me or whatever, however you've decided you're going to receive healing, you have to decide, I'm going to take it as my own. Ain't no devil going to take it out of my hands. He ain't going to try to take it away from me. He may try, but he ain't going to get it. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because this is mine. Amen? Yeah. Listen, it, it doesn't just come automatically any more than, you know, even not sinning or whatever, even more than that. It's, it, 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 it comes by you walking with God, but you also have to decide, what has he said? You can never have faith beyond your knowledge of the word of God and beyond your knowledge of the will of God. So you have to get in there and dig this stuff out and realize that this is real. I'm telling you, I'm a living example of it. God, I've touched every kind of contagious disease. I've been in places that I should have come back sick and caught all this stuff that they were saying. Never did. Haven't caught anything. My mother-in-law, uh, when I met my wife, she, my mother-in-law was a Job witness and was a pioneer. She went door to door, that kind of thing. And so whenever she started really coming around and seeing this work in our lives, which was a big change for her. And then I remember the first time I went to Africa and she was all worried about it. Because she, she came to me and said, you're going to go over there and catch something, and bring it back, it's going to kill us all. <laughs> I said, I'm not going over there to catch something. I'm going over there to kill something. <laughs> Amen? And so, 
so we, we've had all kinds of, of, of things. A lady came into Ukraine. She had a brace on her body. Uh, cancer through her, her entire body. All of her bones were dissolving. She had kids that she couldn't even get there. Her and her husband. She told her kids goodbye. She, the doctor said, you go on this trip, you will die. And she said, I've got to go because if I don't go, I'm going to die. And she got to the meeting. And I started, every day I'd come in, crowd, uh, about 25, three. 2,500, 3,000 people. And every day I walked by and then I, I kind of noticed because it was such a crowd I couldn't see her. She was lying on a pallet over the very back in the back corner. I walked by, walked by, didn't ever see her. And then finally one day I was walking out and I saw her and I zipped across, which totally threw the security off because they, they guard you. I mean, because people will grab you and all kinds of stuff. And so the security, and they are tough, man. They'll push you. If you're there talking, and they'll push you out of the way. And so... I was walking by and I saw her and I'm like, zip that way. And they're like, he's moving. He's moving the other way. He's going the other way. And it, they just freaked out. And so I walked over to her and had my interpreter said, what's, find out what's going on. She told us. And I said, no, this ain't right. And so I just told her, I said, what do you want to do? And she said, I came to be healed. And I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Cancer, you're a liar. You leave her body and you never return. And I command every bone to be re- restructured and recreated in Jesus' name. And I said, now what do you want to do? I said, do you want to get up? I said, whatever you want to do, we'll do it with you. And she said, yes, I want to get up. I said, okay. And I, I actually, I was going to help her up. And she slapped my hand. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I was going to help her up. And she said, she goes, I will do this myself. She said it in Ukrainian, I, I mean Russian. Yeah, Russian. Uh, so I didn't understand her, but I'm like, what's going on? And then my interpreter had to tell me what's going on. I'm like, do it. And she gets up and she got this brace and her husband's standing there and she's like, telling him to get the brace off and they had to take it off, pulls it off and throws it on the side and all of a sudden she starts doing this and starts moving around and then she starts dancing and she, totally healed, totally healed, amen? And then we got, her, we got it on testimony. Uh, she came up and started telling everybody and other people got healed. People started getting healed, throwing their crutches away from her telling their testimony. Started throwing their crutches away, amen? So whatever you got, if you got a crutch or something and you get out, get off of it or drop it or whatever, we got a lady in Poland that was sitting there. I just put my hand on her head and put it back and then took it off. And she had crutches. Her feet were welded. Her, her ankle, she couldn't do that. Like with her feet, they were welded. She had never walked normal. She could only swing her legs. And so when I laid hands on her, commanded to be healed, she put the crutches down, stood up, turns, and walks about three steps first and screams. And to this day, when I hear that, I start crying. Because that's that scream, because she's so happy. And she was completely free. And she started running, and then she ran back. And when she ran back past me, she grabbed me and hugged my neck and just swinging me around. I mean, it's like, okay, here we are. And I'm like, yeah, gee, you know. And I'm like, I let my wife know. That's, that's, that's her, not me. I ain't doing this. You know, because I, I got to come home. You know what I'm saying? I got to come home. So, you know, so, but she was completely healed. And just running. Then later that night, this was in Poland. We had uh, 20, 20 something, I think it's 27 thousand people there. Something like that. It was the largest Christian meeting Poland had ever had. And so uh, we ministered and I prayed for every person, laid hands on every person there. And so later that night, they have video of her dancing, first time in her life. Uh, they had music going and there was a guy helping her and she was dancing. See, there's nothing like that. There ain't no, ain't no drug. Ain't nothing like that. I mean, come on. Ain't nothing like that. No. You get to watch, and, and then I get to go back to the hotel and can't sleep all night. Why? Because I'm laying there playing that over my head and playing over my head. And then they come in and tell me, there's a guy out here outside in a van. He's dying. They got to take him to the hospital or he'd be dead. Uh, but they, they can't leave him here because if he dies here, we'll get in trouble. And I, they said, would you pray for him before you preach? I said, yeah, let's go. So I went and went out to the deal. And there's cops everywhere. There was a, a building next door full of gangsters and they the cops were arresting them bringing them out in handcuffs throwing down machine guns i mean like ak-47s that kind of stuff piling them up on the ground while they're in the building next to where we're having these meetings and all these people are coming out and all these police are out there and there's a police van right next to the van where this guy is lying in and so we walk out there and we open the door and the policeman's looking in there and they see this guy lying in there underneath a blanket no shirt on but under a blanket and i get up in the van and the cops were watching me like what are you doing over there and so I just and I really the guy I thought I thought he was going to die right there I really did because it's how it's, you can tell when somebody's about to die how they breathe and so I'm watching how he's breathing and I'm thinking Jesus you got to do this quick 
And so I laid hands, commanded life, started crying. I do that a lot. And so then I get out, go back in, preach to all these people, go all day long, lay hands on everybody there. And then at the very end, I look up and there's this man with his whole family. And they said, he's, they look, he didn't even look the same. All of his color was back, everything. He's, he's happy. And his wife and kids are all hanging on to him. And they said, he wants a picture with you before we leave. And I'm like, you, I want a picture with him. You know, just <laughs> come on over here. So, you know. But we just seen all that stuff. But I'm telling you, as I was telling you, that night my phone rang. And I had to go to the hospital. And I'm rushing around, trying to get dressed, trying to find my keys. Where's my keys? And the voice of God said, what are you doing? And I said, I ain't got time to talk right now. I'm, 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 that's, I'm serious. I'm like, I ain't got time. I, ain't got, I, gotta, I gotta find my keys. I gotta, he said, why are you rushing? I said, because I gotta go. This guy's gonna die. And he said, if you hurry, you'll heal the sick. If you slow down, you get to raise the dead. And I'm like, ooh. I mean, I mean, I mean who, he, like Wigglesworth said, when, you, when you're when your will is to do the will of God, he'll always have you at the right place at the right time. Amen? Amen. All right. Did y'all get anything out of this tonight? Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Father. I hope I give you some things to think about, some things to work on. Um, you invite me back out. I'd be glad to come back out. I'll be glad to. Amen. Thank you, sir. We'll be back. We'll be back. But now, what's at hand? Let's get you healed. Amen? Because it's already been decreed. It's already a done deal. It's not a matter of if. It's just when. Why not tonight? Amen? All right, say this with me. Father, your word is true. I believe your word. And be it unto me according to your word. You said by his stripes I was healed. I believe you. you. And right now, now, in the name of Jesus, Jesus, I receive my healing. healing. Now, Now, in Jesus' name. name. Father, I thank you for it. it. So be it. it. Amen. Amen. Now begin to thank him for just a minute. We're already done. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. All right, now. Very quickly. Now, um, two things. First off, how many of you got pain in your body? You got pain right now. Some pain in your body right there. Okay. Raise your hands up. All right. Good. We're fixing to get rid of it right now. All right. Now, I don't care why you have it. I don't care how you got it. I don't care how it got there. The fact is it's got to obey. Amen. Amen? Yes. So right now in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you. And in Jesus name. Now, listen, listen carefully. When somebody's praying for you, you don't pray. Why? Because they're praying, it's coming out. If you're praying, it's coming out. I don't want it to come out. I'm trying to put something in you. Yeah. You receive, right? You can't breathe out and breathe in at the same time. So all I want you to do is receive, amen? So you just receive, all right? Now watch this. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, these people's healings has already happened. Yes. You've already paid for it. You've already declared it. You've already decreed it. You have granted it. So right now in the name of Jesus, pain, false pain, spirits of pain, spirit of infirmity, tormenting spirits that cause pain. You will hear and obey the voice of the word of God. You will hear and obey now. These people do not belong to you. Their bodies were bought by Jesus. Their bodies belong to Jesus. Therefore, I serve you eviction. You will leave them, and you will leave them now. In the name of Jesus, right now, pain, false pain, tormenting spirits, I command you in the name of Jesus, go now in Jesus' name. It will be this way and no other. You will obey now in Jesus' name. Now, bodies, be healed. Be healed now in Jesus' name. Now, right now, right now, begin to check for that pain because it's gone. When you see it's gone, raise your hand. Let me see. Pain gone. Raise it up. Raise it up. Pain gone. Pain gone. There you go. There you go. Now what? Look at that. See that? Now, uh, who, who touched you? Wasn't Curry Blake. It was Jesus. Amen? Look at that. Check it out. Keep it going. You watch. Watch this. You watch. 
It'll just keep on working and keep on working. Amen? Now, whatever was causing that pain, that's gone too. You understand? He doesn't just remove the pain. God, is, God didn't like, he's not like a doctor. He's not going to numb you so you don't feel it. He actually fixes the cause and therefore the pain has to go. Do, do you get that? And so whatever it was that caused it, that's gone too. The reason we hit the pain is because it's something you can feel. So that also signifies to you that the thing that was causing it, which is usually a, a lot worse than the pain, that that's gone too. God doesn't play. He's not going to tease you. He's not going to lie to you, take away the pain, make you think you were healed when you're not. Amen? Amen? Amen. 